everyone and welcome to another episode of Battle Chat. This is Battle Chat number 19. Can you believe it? No, 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 19. And this evening I've got a special guest who I've managed to persuade to come on the show. I've uh, been wanting to come on for a long time actually because we've known each other quite some time. But before I come to this celebrity of the hobby let me just briefly uh, mention the terrific weekend that i just had uh, which encompassed not one but two events um, first of all on saturday i was down in southampton in the morning for mark backhouse's uh, come and have a go if you think you're lard enough event which is the first uh, first one of those events the very first one the inaugural event and it was brilliant absolutely brilliant there was a bunch of guys there i couldn't say precisely how many 40 or 50 it looked like who were having an absolutely brilliant time trying out different two fat lardies games and of course the lords of lard themselves were there rich clark and nick skinner together with their laboratory assistant sydney roundwood also a guest on this show um and it was just brilliant it was really friendly Everyone was clearly having a good time. There were some really interesting games as well. Um, this is one of the things I've noticed about the, the Lardy games, things like Sharp Practice, that you know you might normally think, well, that's a Napoleonic game, isn't it? Well, people were doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things. American Civil War things, uh, wars involving samurai, the last of the age of the samurai, and uh, bits of uh, colonial kind of British history against the Hossa in Africa and so forth. There was Chain of Command games going on. There was Through the Mud and the Blood. There was Bag the Han. There was Water Tanker. Um, just in the morning that I saw and then I know that there was some changeover in the afternoon so that was absolutely brilliant well done to Mark and everyone who helped him organize that fantastic uh, and a big shout out to Nick and Sid and Rich for turning up at yet another Lard event I know they put in a huge amount of effort to get to as many Lard events as they can so well done to all them then I raced positively raced of course within the speed limits uh up to basingstoke um to the uh, the wonderful surroundings of the holiday in basingstoke on the outskirts of town where actually i crashed out prior to meeting up with the people attending the donald featherstone tribute weekend which is a regular thing held every year organized by mark freeth and the war games holiday center which is kind of just outside basingstoke in a little place called king's clear sort of middle of nowhere um but anyway it was a, a, a then we had a, a dinner in the evening where people foolishly let me speak and give a little bit of a talk about don featherstone along with some other people and we ran a charity auction as well in favor of combat stress where together with the portion of the fee that mark extracts from people to go to the charity uh, the the charity auction itself raised about 650 pounds which when you're considering there was only 14 people participating is pretty remarkable um and that uh, raised about 650 then add the bits that mark's collected means we raised about a thousand pounds for combat stress over the weekend which is absolutely fantastic uh, the game itself that was being staged at the whc was run by steve thompson previously owner of garrison miniatures and all sorts of things uh, heavily involved in the in the reading club uh, he's been around in the hobby for donkey's years steve has uh, and he <laughs> staged this huge colonial game for the the participants uh, which was sort of a bit along the lines of the uh, the game that Peter Gilder um, used to run, where you've got these randomly generated Mardists kind of flooding in from all directions and shredding the British column that's got to get through and try and besiege a town. Uh, so it was, it was a brilliant looking game. Thousands, I think he said he painted 2,000 miniatures in the last year for this, and he'd made two fantastic kind of riverboat steamer things and a gunboat and there was crocodiles and all sorts it was just an amazing looking game and the players evidently had fun and in fact the rules that he's uh done for uh, did for the creative of the game um i'm having a word with him and it looks like we're going to be able to kind of make that available to people for as a pdf for like a pound a copy and all the money will go to charity everything will go to combat stress so thanks steve that was fantastic and well done to mark and his wife karen at the war games holiday center for organizing yet another fantastic don featherstone tribute weekend 
which gives forms a kind of interlude there for you, an intermission. As I, I you, you've got to understand here, I'm, I'm sitting in front of my Mac, gazing into the eyes of one of my wargaming heroes, uh, who's uh, sitting, looks very cute with his headphones on, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But this is a man, and he is a man, uh, despite rumours to the contrary. This is a man <laughs> who um, has been in the hobby for a long time. In fact, I'm going to cast my mind back to 2006 when I was first starting Battle Games. And early that year in 2006, there was the Cavalier Show in uh, Tunbridge, which back then, oh my goodness me, was held in the environs of a school. Uh, which was interesting because it, it kind of reminded me back in the day of the old Present Arms show that used to be held at the Rochway Youth Centre uh, in Essex. But here we were in Tunbridge in this school with all these games tucked away in these side rooms and stuff. And one of the games was, if I recall correctly, a sort of Stalingrad game. And, and the, these people, and it was the Loughton Strike Force, of course, had sprinkled snow all over this terrain as well. And it looked magnificent. So magnificent that, if I recall correctly, it featured on the front cover of, I think it was my second or third issue of Battle Games, um, because it looked brilliant. And, of course, the senior member of the Loughton Strike Force who was responsible for this and for the rules they were using to play it was none other than Mr. David Brown. Good evening, David. Evening, Henry. How are you? All right, and I hope you like that build-up for you. <laughs> it was a little too grand, I fear. But yes, very nice, thanks. Dave is very down to earth, uh, considering that his his other name was Poirot, of course, because he is a top man in Her Majesty's police force. Uh, but we shan't dwell on that just yet. Uh, but anyway. David, thanks so much for coming on the show. We've been wanting to do this for ages. Um, for, you know, for quite apart from anything else, quite apart from the fact that, you know, I've met you a long time ago in the history of wargaming uh, and that, you know, you're a nice bloke, but also you are a man who's been fairly prolific in terms of producing sets of rules that people enjoy uh, and uh, you've had a long sort of uh, rule writing career and you've it's taken an interesting turn in the last couple of years where you've been now publishing them via a different route from the way you did before mm -hmm. um, but I tell you what Dave just for the people because there may well be some people who knows from the various four corners of the earth who don't know who you are uh, and so it would be jolly nice if you w would kind of introduce yourself give some, give the nice people a bit of background about you know how you got into the hobby like I ask everyone to do and your kind of journey through the hobby up to the point where you decided do you know what I think I'm going to start writing some rules yeah well uh I think, Henry, that my uh, journey into the hobby was not dissimilar to many other people's. Yep. Uh, when I was uh, at, at school, one of the things most of us did was um, either make airfix kits or buy airfix soldiers. Um, and that's what I did. Uh, my dad would buy me the odd uh, model here or there and I'd make it. Uh, and I can recall I had uh, some of those yellow airfix napoleonic soldiers didn't we but, all uh, yeah <laughs> that's right that's right but um but i i mean i didn't do uh, very much with them other than to to hurl marbles at them like i think many of us did in those days or or, or make tanks that weren't particularly well made or particularly well painted but uh, what the two things that uh, got me i think into the hobby was first of all when uh, we moved to somerset we moved next door to uh, uh, a farm that had three lads on it. All went to the same school as I did. Oh, right. And of course, yeah, they all and they all had airfix soldiers. So obviously, you know, you get to know each other. And unbelievably, when I went over there with some soldiers that so will have a game of soldiers, they were playing a version that didn't involve marbles. Oh. And it involved things called a ruler and dice. And this was all very strange to me. I thought, a ruler and dice? So I had to go you know, use the ruler and dice. And it were rules such as um, it would, if your man was in hard cover, it was a six to hit him. If he was in soft cover, a five or six. And if he was in the open, it would be a four, four to six. Um, and it had uh, uh, great rules like if your airfix figure was in a charging pose, he could move 12 inches. 
Oh, wow. Or if he, <laughs> that actually if depended he was, on the pose of the figure. Yes, that's, yeah, absolutely. If he was standing, it was, you know, eight. Or if he was crawling, they were useless. They could only go about three <laughs> inches. <laughs> so, well, uh, and, you know, it had all the usual stuff. With It was World War Two airfix that we played with and obviously you know your Bren gunner would get three dice whereas a, 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 you know, a, a chap with a pistol would a range of something like four inches and one dice you know yeah. which was so officers were clearly rubbish <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. no one wanted those and it uh, and that developed um, that journey of, of uh, uh, taking their rules and then uh, developing them further and I, I, I presume they must have got them from either you know Don Featherstone or Charles Grant's right. uh, I lo- original I love books. that concept of, you know, if you're lumbered with a bunch of crawling figures, basically you're stuck. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> it oh, was all... <laughs> so what would it have been like if you'd had the commando set where they're stuck in a blooming dinghy? <laughs> yeah, they were rubbish. Yeah, that's it. They weren't much cotton. German machine gunners, everything that lied down was... Oh, my was, God. Uh, yeah, yeah. So rubbish. how old... So you would have been how old, roughly, David? Oh, uh, literally, that was... Um, I would have been 10, 11, just before right. scene score just moved moving into right. senior school to about that sort of age is when, when yeah. we moved there. Uh, and that uh, tied in, I think, in about that year or maybe a year or two later, with seeing a, a programme on telly, I don't know what it is, your typical Sunday afternoon telly or whatever, yeah. that was called, um, uh, I can't remember what it was called, it was either called Battle Games, which might I might have got that wrong, but it involved... Uh, I think it was Edward Woodward or someone. and oh, um, Battleground, wasn't it? Battleground, called? that was it, yeah. yeah, yeah. We had about two or three or four series, yeah. and the first one I saw was on uh, Gettysburg. Yeah. And I was completely hooked by the look uh, of those soldiers. I think it was all Peter Gilbert's. Absolutely, uh, it would have been hitch yeah. stuff, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was fat. the terrain and the troops, they, they just hooked me. Yeah. And then I managed to see, I think it was the next episode, which was uh, Waterloo. Right. Uh, and of course, for me, that was uh, uh, that was it. That absolutely uh, uh, got me. Yeah. Uh, and unbelievably, these um, these figures were based up in in fours or eights yes. or, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I uh, so I slavishly copied that. So all the um, Yellow airfix uh, soldiers were based up in uh, in a similar manner, in, according to memory, because obviously you couldn't record it in yeah, those days. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and that developed, and then uh, my dad kind of obviously noticed, so he uh, uh, he bought me a few copies of uh, military modelling. Um, we uh, picked on, uh, went into I think it was Taunton in those days when we used to live fairly near to, right. and he got me into the Taunton Military Modelling Club. Oh. That then led on to the Taunton War Game Society, and um, you know, uh, I think I'd, I'd probably join that when I was about f- uh, 14, 15, 16. Right. And, and um, I still remember now it was, it was it was fairly traumatic my first introduction to uh, to sort of proper war gaming. Uh, uh, we were playing, I think it was WRG, either fourth or fifth edition. I can't remember yeah, yeah. now, and. Um, I can recall my my opponent had, uh, I think it was a Viking army, uh, all armed with what were clearly two-handed massive <laughs> chopping weapons. <laughs> and I was just giving these Greeks or whatever they were, and I thought, well, these look quite good. They look disciplined yeah, yeah. and regular. Yeah. I should be able to um, you know, give him a run for his money. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I think it lasted about four rounds as they were just massive. <laughs> by... <laughs> By two-handed chopping weapons. Was this using the WRG rules back then? Yes, it was. Oh yeah. my God! Yes, two-handed cutting weapons That's under it, WRG, yeah. which is <laughs> plus five or something. Yeah, like. absolutely. Yeah, brings back all those horrific memories. <laughs> and and um, I can remember building up. So I thought, right, I'll go and buy oh, buy a, a, an army. And I, I bought. They were Mike's models. Uh, Greek hoplites, because this oh, chap right, had let yeah. me. And I thought, oh, no, I'll copy that. It looks good. Yeah, yeah. But. But obviously, then over the next few months, I had to upgrade them because C-class hoplites were clearly rubbish yeah. and got massacred. And then I had to upgrade them to B-class Thebans or Spartans. Oh, God, uh, to, yes. And, and I think that helped. I think they lasted about five turns before <laughs> they were summarily routed. Oh, God. And, and I recall in the very final battles, I was up to Spartan guards. Oh, my God. With kind of javelin at first contact. And... 
I really? almost won. But almost. <laughs> yes, it Brilliant. didn't make any difference. Brilliant. Um, I love that because that, that does bring back so many memories uh, for me as well at school of uh, bizarre combinations. This, <laughs> it's one of those things, isn't it, that, you know, uh, in inverted commas, very historical war games do kind of get yeah. cross about in uh, kind of ancient um, kind of tournaments and stuff where you have got Vikings against the hot plights yeah. and that sort of thing. Uh, but yes, that memory there, Dave, of the two handed cutting weapon, yeah. because I remember um, my mate Guy and I, when we were playing Arabs against Theban Byzantines, he had some kind of uh, warrior fanatic types. I can't remember what they were called now, but they had huge two-handed swords they're like ceremonial kind of execution weapons basically where you would have needed probably 20 foot square space to even swing the damn thing <laughs> but under wrg rules they come into contact you know with my poor um you know spearman or whatever in the front row and they just hack everything to pieces it was just awful but there we are what a laugh what a laugh so then um you see the, the bit of your life you're describing there you're living down in somerset so at what point then did you become involved with the Loughton strike force dave uh well uh basically i moved uh, down to london i think in about 1988 right. basically usual stuff isn't it uh, job opportunities yeah um you know, you finish your education, you've got your degree, but you still can't get a half reasonable job. But yeah. London, well, that has a lot of opportunities. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, moved down to London, uh, took up employment uh, in London. And of course, you did the first thing was look around for a few clubs. Uh, initially, I was at, uh, went down to uh, Ilford. I think it was Ilford War Games Club, had a few few games there. And then I found uh, Loughton, which was clearly nearer and more just more convenient. Mm. Uh, and, and been at Loughton ever since. With a yeah, right because bunch I mean, of I think I think a lot of people may have encountered you at shows because you do the show yeah. circuit yeah. quite yeah. a lot, uh, and and you put on a lot of games. Uh, and also, you, I, I mean, I can remember over the years, you must have put on about a hundred different versions of La Hay, the Attack Around La Hay yeah. <laughs> yes. or Ugamont or whatever. Yes. Uh, quite remarkable, really. And of course, I also remember. Uh, you were uh, involved in organising that huge kind of Waterloo weekend that I came yeah. along to, which is oh god, it was probably about mm, ten years ago now. Whatever it is, I've lost track of time. Oh, yeah, um, that was uh, South Mims, wasn't it? Yeah, that's it. The South Mims, yep. ladies and gentlemen, may we present to you the salubrious surroundings of the South <laughs> Mims <laughs> Travelodge Services area. Uh, but it was ideal actually. You had this huge room. Uh, with not one but two games, so there was an enormous Waterloo that must have been about what thirty feet by six feet or something. Yeah, and the yeah, that's all it. in fifteen mil, beautiful, absolutely stunning. And I I I can't remember which issue of uh, Battle Games it was, but I did cover that and got mm. lots of pretty pictures. And also next to it, of course, um, your good friend Eclaireur. Whose yes. name we have to leave of, as Eclair for, for reasons I know, I am aware yeah, of. Well, but reasons of national security. Reasons yeah. of national security, pretty much. Uh, were you to bump into Eclair, you might go, oh, you look familiar, but we can't say on air who this person is, but he's a very nice chap. Uh, mm. But he, um, something we're going to talk about later, he was put on the Battle of New York or something, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, I think so, yeah. yeah so towards the end, latter part of the American War of Independence. Mm. But that mm. was in... Um, uh, 28 mil as opposed to 15 mil yeah. and used a lot of Perry Miniatures stuff and it looked, mm. you know, it looked gorgeous. And it ha I have to say, it's probably the biggest AWI battle I've ever seen staged uh, as a war game because most AWI battles, I don't have to tell Melissa's, you know, they're fairly small affairs by European standards. Uh, and But this one actually had a lot of minis on the table. I can't remember how many. Plus also a whole load of siege lines, you know, redoubts yeah. and earthworks and all that kind of stuff. It was gorgeous looking thing. Um, so, yes... Uh, that brings back a lot of memories. So staging games has always been one of your things, hasn't it, Dave? Yeah, it's. it's um, I think I was quite lucky when I uh, initially got to Loughton. They already had uh, a tradition of uh, putting on uh, games at shows, and I just literally uh, uh, stepped in. Uh, and I think one, you know, one of one years they said, "Well, you know, we we haven't got one. Uh, how about you?" And I thought, I'll, I'll, "I'll do my my staple. Let's just put a put a Napoleonic on." 
and go from there. And you know what it's like, isn't it? Once you've done one, mm. you, you then get the bit of the, the the bug, and you want to you want to keep doing it, and you, you get hooked into the circuit. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's one of the things now that we uh, we enjoy is the, the the preparation of it, and it and the thing I also like about it is it is you suddenly get that. Uh, motivation to get things painted yes, and get yes, things yes. done, yeah, which yeah. is uh, exactly what we're we're doing uh, for uh, salute uh, this year. We're going to put on a battle yeah. of uh, 1815, the Battle of Ligny, uh, and oh, we've right. built yeah we've built all the uh, the village. We've gone to a little bit of extra effort to make sure that the the village looks good. But then obviously I've had that spurt to make sure that all the troops look right, all the vignettes are there. Yeah, uh, yeah. The rebasing has been done, artillery has been rebased. Yeah. So you know, it it it's not only is it enjoyable putting on shows, uh, you know, and, and not only just putting on the display, but obviously uh, just meeting and chatting to people. But it also helps get your armies finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's worth mentioning that um, casting my mind back, um, you and the Lauten boys have always been very keen on kind of the visual aspect of the games that yeah. you put on as display, yeah. haven't you? That you've got really nicely painted and based troops but also the terrain always looks really nice and i can say that you know i'm thinking back to your world war Two stuff you staged acw stuff and kind of napoleonic stuff mm. um and it's they're always a pleasure to see and you're very much into kind of creating that sort of tableau so you have as you yeah. say you've got the little vignettes and other bits and pieces going on around the periphery of the battle that kind of make a difference yeah. so I mean, is that something that you picked up because of your love of, you know, Peter Gilder's stuff? Do you think? Yeah. I, 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 do you know where that came from? And I've got, I've got the book here, Henry. Oh, although, uh, we, although we can't see it. <laughs> it's right. It all came from, and there was uh, that I found in my local library many years ago, which was David Chandler's *The Art of Warfare on Land*, uh, oh. which was, yeah, it, which which covers uh, about how many battles are here? We've got about ten battles from classical warfare all the way through to the second world war it's one of those uh, right. great all-rounder hold it books. up to the camera and wave it at me so there I... you are have you seen right. that one there up a bit up a bit up there a... you go oh See wow that? you must know that one and of course on the back it's got peter gilder's gettysburg um oh, right. all laid out in its uh, in its finery and glory yeah yeah but what really got me were the pictures of, of course, Waterloo is its main uh, yeah. main kind of feature in, in, for the Napoleonic period. And it had uh, a full spread of Peter Gilder's uh, Waterloo terrain with all his Hinchley figures on it. And as oh, a, wow. you know, a kid of about whatever, 11, 12, 13. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, as you say, it was the same, I think the same terrain that was in that Battleground series. And those ah. pictures, I thought that, that really got me, and mm. I thought, I want my games to look like that. Yeah, so yeah. not only did I want the, the, the troops to look good uh, and based up the way they'd done it, but the terrain looked good, and it was about getting the terrain to look right, um, not necessarily be perfect in every millimetre, every detail, but it just had to look right, mm. uh, if you get if you get where I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it is, it's that, uh, the paying attention to the smaller details like uh, maybe La Haye Saint is slightly sunken into the into the ridge rather yes, than just yes, plonked yes. on uh, yeah. and there'll be a, a sunken road and then maybe you can include in your sunken road some you know artillery limbers or whatever yeah. artillery pieces moving along and it's all that those sort of bits that, that build the whole picture yeah uh, and if that's what I, I, I think display games are like it's like i mean i like the same thing when i see other display games at salute or wherever it's looking uh, at the terrain and basically being thinking that is fantastic yeah, look at those yeah. bits and it and you get drawn into the detail yeah uh, and, I, and i think that's certainly a reputation sh- I, I mean i think particularly shows like partisan and the other partisan uh, the new York boys have always kind of drawn um some of the kind of the the best uh, get best looking games uh, in yeah. the hobby as, as demo games I mean it's one of those things that is a matter of debate isn't it in, in the hobby and I think it always will be this kind of um, the, the demo game versus the participation game mm. thing and mm. what is the point of the demo game to a certain extent I my feeling is that the point of the demo game is just to inspire people you know it's got as i think it's probably got as much to do with the collecting bug 
and yeah. the making and building bug as it has with the gaming bug i think uh you know there are because there are other games that people put on you can see the crowd's really excited and they're having a good time but the terrain's not necessarily anything to to write home about if you can strike that balance you know and get something that's visually good looking with an exciting game that's obviously kind of the holy grail for all of us isn't it mm, yeah uh, and uh you know i think that's one of the things i've over the years, thinking back to the games I've seen, the Napoleonic games, that I've come away thinking, God, oh, you know what? Absolutely gorgeous. You know, but <laughs> seriously, though, I mean, because there's, there's something for me. One of my things is uh, Napoleonic French Carabiniers. Yes. I think that's <laughs> one of the most gorgeous, <laughs> glorious uniforms Ever, ever in, made ever yes. invented isn't it it's just let's be blunt it's sexy it's just yeah. and there's nothing because they're all on big black horses as well and there's nothing quite like a regiment of carabiniers kind of thundering up the ridge it's just <laughs> one of those things and i can remember you know two or three or four or maybe half a dozen of your games where and it doesn't matter whether it's in 15 mil or 28 mil mm. they're an eye-catching unit and i think that is one of the things that you and the Loughton guys have always delivered is that moment of drama where you've got those dramatic looking units at a key point in a big battle you know which uh, and round the Hay Saint obviously with the Nays Cavalry Charge and that kind of thing it bears endless replay doesn't it I mean it's, no one's <laughs> going to come along saying mm, I'm bored with that because every time you look at it go, oh my god it's gorgeous and and you guys are so good I've talked before on this show about kind of miniature world creation. Mm -hmm. And there are times that are just so cinematic and that, that very much is that. And you mentioned the Waterloo movie earlier, which, uh, you know, I can imagine was probably a big influence on you, wasn't it? Yeah, no, uh, certainly when that, when that, uh, uh, came on, came on the, t the telly. It was, it was shoving your sisters out of the room, telling them <laughs> to be quiet and watching that. But it is, I think that, uh, uh, demo games are it's, a, it's one of their aspects is about capturing that panoramic diorama yeah. that war games can can deliver yeah. uh, and it's in, it's important to think of what is it that we're actually putting on here yeah. and what is it that that are, you know what would i like to look at so you know, i'm yeah. probably no different from anyone else so if i'm going to like the look of it probably so is everyone else so, yeah so let's go quite you know without any you know without any uh, concern about it let's go for the sexy bits yeah, of yeah. battles what is it that people want to see uh, well they want to see mass cavalry charges at waterloo yeah. uh, they want to see the old guard going up they want to yeah. see the battle around ugamon la Haye saint yeah. uh, those are the great uh, you know uh, dioramas that we could so let's put those on yeah, yeah. and i must admit it's not um i can't take uh, by any means all the credit because i've been ably assisted by sure. genuine uh, kind of artists at Loud and Strike Force, and, and I think you probably know the sorts of uh, the people I'm talking about. They are just natural modellers and painters mm. who you can just go, um, "Here's a church. I've vaguely painted it. I've done the best I can. Would you mind just giving it a fun?" And they'll kind of look at you down their nose in that kind of artistic <laughs> way. <laughs> And then they will just come back after, literally. Uh, and they're always quick at doing stuff, which is really slightly annoying. Yes, <laughs> and they'll just come back with the most beautifully uh, painted, whatever it is, church, the hay saint, with yeah. added bits. Yeah. You know, they'll have put on shading. They'll put on moss on the slates. They'll have added uh, extras, all that. And you learn from those people yes, because yes. They're, they're natural artists. I mean, I'm not, but... You, you learn and you pick up bits. I, I mean, um, it, at Salute this year, if you're, you're there, you'll see our, our, our Lincoln Village, and that's been put together uh, in the main by uh, Martin, our glorious sort of artist on that front. I just kind of held the hot glue gun and passed him bits, uh, you know, <laughs> as we stuck them together. <laughs> but, it's, uh, but it all contributes, and I've always been uh, an advocate that I think uh, that demonstration games are participation yeah. and I've been more than happy for you know people to come along and if they want to grab a you know a brigade or some troops uh, and push some troops around for you know for 10 15 minutes or even two hours then then you know they're more than welcome to do that we quite often do that at, uh, at the various shows and of course that's uh, a nice segue because that's another great way of introducing people to your rules of course 
because uh, you've got a bit of a reputation for writing rules. Um, and um, probably what now think back that World War Two game that I first saw at that Cavalier show, Dave. Yeah. What, that would have been your own rule set, presumably. Yeah, that was um, a Panzergrenadier, idea, a battle group Panzergrenadier. Right. Idea. So what then? Because it wasn't actually published until slightly later than that, I seem to recall. That so that must have been one of your test versions of the rule set. Yeah, it was. I, I can't quite remember when they, they initially came out, but yeah, that's what that quite often your you know, what's useful in a, in a rule development thing is to is to put them out. Yeah, People yeah. could uh, join in and have a, uh, a part of participation in the in the demo game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get some pretty good feedback on what your rules are like. <laughs> and immediate as well. Yes, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Whether it's printable or not. Uh, brilliant. Well, we get on to it's kind of a, a, a more in-depth discussion about your rule sets in just a minute. Uh, I just wanted to kind of bring in a bit more of your background in case, you know, for people who don't know you. I mean, there's, and there's two aspects for that. The first thing is that you are a policeman uh, and have been for how long now, Dave? Well, well, to be uh, get completely up to date, Henry, I it, it's now in the past. I was. I had the glorious, glorious uh, opportunity to retire. Yeah, that's right. Far too young to retire. Uh, uh, I young. know, I know. Those that's boyish it. good looks. <laughs> Hardly. So I'm having a little bit of a break. Yeah, so 28 years. 28 yeah. years. So you rose from a plod on the beat up to what rank in the end? Uh, inspector. You were an inspector. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's it. it was like for, I always, I was, um, uh, for people in the know, I was uh, what they call a... Uh, 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 a relief nutter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to really do anything else. I did a, a number of jobs, as you do in, in mm -hmm. these environments, but I always came back to um, its relief response team, which is the, you know, right. responding to the 999 calls, yeah. early lates and nights, uh, right. doing all that. And wow. uh, doing that on the, for, on the, in the um, east end of London for over 20 years. Uh, cool. You must well, must have seen oh, a few a things, bit. Dave. <laughs> must have seen a few things, mate. I imagine many of which possibly you, either you don't, you you can't, or you wouldn't want to talk about. I imagine. <laughs> but uh, but the other aspect is, of course, you were also in the territorials, weren't you? Oh uh, well, um, yeah, I was in um, uh, in a couple of units, but my uh, uh, initially joined the the infantry, which is. Uh, Six uh, LI, which is Somerset Light Infantry. Of course, yeah, famous yeah. unit. Uh, yeah, the uh, Prince Alberts, etc. Had a quite a famous history. Um, yeah, that's a, a, a part of the thing. As at one stage in my life, where I thought, you know, am I going to undertake a kind of military career? Well, if I'm going to do that, you better get down in the dirt and dig some slit trenches and see how an SLR is stripped or or not, as the case may yeah, be. Yeah. It's a lot. Um, going back, it? <laughs> but it was uh, it's also uh, pretty much at the same time i was um uh starting to dabble in rule writing at the uh taunton club and other bits and pieces <clears throat> right. and it's one of those things that i said to myself if you want to know what uh you know yomping along with uh, 20, 25 pound of webbing and a, a gpmg and everything else on your shoulders well then go and do it mm. Um, and so it was, a, uh, it was an opportunity to do that. And um, I think, like most people, once you've done a, a, a couple of years in, in the infantry, mm. you, you kind of get an idea of what it's all about. You get an idea of how heavy stuff is, yeah. how tiring it all is, yeah. uh, about ideas about ammunition expenditure, mm. um, giving orders when it's very loud <laughs> and people aren't going in the right direction they can't hear you because uh, even blanks are pretty loud yeah, yeah. um uh, and so yeah i, I you know as, as you'd expect you learn a lot yeah. from uh low, i mean it's only in um, you know section and platoon level uh stuff but you 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 uh, you in that unit mm. uh, but you you learn a lot about infantry work and yeah. command yeah. And then obviously that translates um, into your kind of your thinking in uh, in, in war games rules. That's that's quite interesting. So if you're an actor, you would be a method actor. Right? Yes, I would. That's right. <laughs> Get down into the dirt. <laughs> Whereas I would be Sir Laurence Olivier and retort with, "It's called acting, darling." <laughs> For a reason. Yes, that's right. <laughs> but uh, but no, that's that's really interesting. So so you did uh, time as an infantryman, and then you moved to a different unit. You said. 
Yes, I did. Are you are you allowed to tell us what this next unit was, or is that dead secret? <laughs> uh, let's just. Uh, we, it's two four three field ambulance. Oh right! Wow. Yeah. It's not. But anyway, it's that. not. Oh right, okay. That's a pretend name. Okay, right. But never mind, ladies and gentlemen. We can't talk about that. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. Um, thanks for that background. But as you say, that so that informed <clears throat> your rule writing, that experience. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. And <clears throat> and obviously, even being a copper, of course, who's who's responding to emergency stuff, you get familiar with what most civilians would call you know a combat situation a dangerous situation oh, yeah. uh, and and how to spot when things are about to kick off and all that kind of stuff yeah, yeah. um so this has been you know obviously um very useful grist to your mill and yeah, yeah. uh, so was it the world war Two rule set that was the first rule set that you wrote then dave uh no the uh the the first one was um the basically the Napoleonics. That was always my kind of my, my first love, my first, uh, main interest. Clearly, World War Two was always there uh, mm. uh, and and uh, ticking along in the background. But actually, I found that writing Napoleonic rules was easier uh, than right. uh, World War Two or modern. So I think modern combat is really quite difficult to model. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure we're all we're all aware. Um, uh, and so uh, I I. Fiddled uh, yeah, around, sort of trying to remodel Bruce Quarry's airfix rules. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, yeah, I was typing out that casualty chart umpteen <laughs> times and uh, the thirty-three and, times table. <laughs> that's right, that's it. Um, uh, shortening it, uh, then doing the morale checks that just seemed to go on forever, yeah. um, and shortening them or uh, lengthening them in in other places. Um, and it was we. Then moved into wargaming after Quarry. We moved into, I think we did, you know, most what most, most people do. We did you know, Napoleon's battles. We even had a dabble at, I think the rules were called uh, Eagle Bearer, which were kind of oh, computer moderated. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, they were, they were, they were interesting uh, yeah. in the early days of computing. You'd spend, I think, two days inputting all the units, uh, and then after half an hour, it would crash, and it would be kind of. <laughs> We're gonna have to reset the game or whatever. So that was so that was interesting. Uh, and then of course we moved. Uh, we picked up um, Grand Manor, which was yeah, yeah. always uh, you know uh, in my kind of in my territory because of the Gilda yeah. connection. There it is. That's the one. Waving my copy here. Yeah, green cover and gold writing and Napoleonic laurel wreath. Yeah, yeah that was the one. Yeah. Uh, so much so that we even. Um, we went off down to, uh, well, up to Scarborough on a couple of occasions yeah, yeah. Uh, where we played with um, Jerry Elliott. We did Waterloo and, and Vargram. And I can remember on both occasions on the long drive back down, that's probably about five hours. Yeah. It was, uh, it was, we were doing what all war gamers do, isn't it? You digest the battle and how that went. Mm. And then you dissect the rules. Yes, yes. And yes. <laughs> it was, you know, does this work? Does that work? What do we like about it? What we mm. didn't like about it? Uh, and and that was the push. And I think, well, there are many aspects of this that I think, in, not that I could do better, but I could do differently to suit mm. my uh, vision of what Napoleonics was about. Mm. Uh, and so that that um, led into. Uh, General General de Brigade. So I'll start off with that. So so talk about that because I I remember actually, and again, we're getting old. It's a few years yeah. ago now. <laughs> uh, quite a few years ago, you actually wrote an article for me in Battle Games about your inspiration and and yeah, how yeah. Your, your the influence of Gilder and that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, and it's long enough ago now that I can't remember what you said to be honest. Yeah. So <laughs> I think it would be quite useful to people. So so clearly Gilder had an influence over you yeah. Uh, yeah apart from anything else i think you had a, a hold over all of us because of the sheer look of the thing you know that yeah. grand manner gaming with relatively big units i mean not enormous yeah. but they were kind of 36 ish yeah kind 30, of average, about 30 yeah <clears throat> that kind of size of unit on that gorgeous and huge extensive terrain of course uh, so there was the look of the thing and uh, m my recollection because it's a long time now since i've played it there was quite a lot of sort of drama in, in mm. the rules mm. as well yeah 
Uh, I, my recollection is the one thing I really hated was all the curtain rings. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because casualties, casualties were indicated with what some people call caps, which always confused me, but actually yeah. amounted to these little plastic curtain rings. And it always baffled me that someone's gone to all this trouble to make this beautiful terrain, paint these beautiful figures on mass that just look stunning, and then when there's a casualty, stick a little yeah, white plastic know. ring yeah. over its neck, which is just like <laughs> what is that? It, it rather spoils the look of it, isn't it? It takes, you, it takes you out of the war game. Absolutely, yeah. kind of there's yeah. they've gone to all that trouble to build this world as we were saying earlier, and then this giant hand comes down and sticks a curtain <laughs> ring over its neck. So, But anyway, so visually... Without the curtain rings, it looks stunning. And as I say, there was kind of a, a, a drama and flow to the rules. I think they were certainly suited as rules to really big games where you had lots yep. of players yep. and literally many, many thousands of troops on troops. the table. Uh, which, but of course, you must have been thinking, yeah, but normally we play on an 8 by 6 or something like mm-hmm. that. Uh, yeah. Is it translatable? to that kind of environment so you know what conclusions did you draw dave and what then kind of gave you the inspiration to go on and write what became general de brigade well it's because it was uh as as you say we we, you would play a a normal inverted commas uh war game at home using grand manor or or, and it's it's variations and and those questions as you that you've just hinted at would would always come up i mean one of the things i can remember was um one uh, chap who's had a British army had the 95th rifles in close order and the first question was oh okay here they come right well I'm going to break them up and put them into uh, into skirmish or open order yeah. uh, and it, it, under that particular edition of the rules it might have changed but you couldn't because there are only two types of uh, well, one type of skirmishes and those are the, the permanent little skirmish units yes, you had at the right. start yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that led to discussions and I'm thinking okay about you know this doesn't seem to quite reflect the tactics of the period. Yeah. Um, and then we had discussions uh, uh, about uh, command and control, about the fact that you, I, I can remember saying in a battle where somebody literally would, would attack for two turns, then think the better of it, and then retreat back behind a hedge or whatever it was, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then have a little bit of a rethink, regain, oh, say, oh it looks, doesn't look too bad now, I'm coming sailing out <laughs> again. <laughs> And we were just going, oh, come on, you've got to have some kind of order yeah. that you would uh, have received from your senior officer that would dictate what you, you have to do. You can't just willy-nilly uh, send a you know man back and forth over a hedge. Uh, and we also had the classic things that when you saw a breakthrough going happening on the far right-hand flank, uh, people would be immediately responding to it and, yes, and just yes, peeling yes. off batteries or regiments to yeah. go pell-mell over to the left flank to, to, to protect it yeah. uh, without any reference to orders or their yeah, brigades yeah. or structures. Yeah. So so all I was aim of a general brigade was to kind of bring a military structure mm. to that kind of war game. Mm. I didn't want to lose the, uh, as you say, the drama and the excitement of charges, uh, of cavalry charges and artillery, you know, going into action. But what I did want to bring was a Napoleonic command structure mm. to the game. Yeah. So uh, that, hence the the, the title is General to Brigade. You have a number of brigades, yeah. and those brigades uh, stick together. Yeah. Uh, and they're there. There. That's the kind of command unit, and the brigades get orders. Uh, and under General to Brigade, those orders were you know assault, or engage, or hold, or, or whatever. Uh, and it would take command efforts or, you know, through our dice rolls to actually change those orders. Mm. So suddenly the games that we played went from a kind of pell-mell, do-as-you-want, individual mm. units racing everywhere mm. to structured Napoleonic game that looked right. Yeah. And when things started to happen or go wrong or go right, you needed to refer to a kind of command and control system to get something to happen in response yeah. to that yeah. so um and that was it changed not only kind of the look of the game how the game was played but it also changed how uh board gamers gamed the, the game they suddenly yeah, took yeah. on a different concept uh and and from that obviously came uh general brigade and i was i was quite lucky that good old um dave ryan at caliber books took a punt on it mm. and he went oh, 
I'm looking for a Napoleonic set. I think we're <laughs> putting on a, a game in the Tower of London in one of his kind of very early shows. All oh, right. Um, and uh, we were doing Dresden or a piece of Dresden, and he was, uh, you know, you know, thankfully he's reasonably taken with this, and I'll give it a punt. Go on then. <laughs> so. Frankie. So when was it? When was General de Brigade first published? Because it seems to have been around for as long as I can remember. Uh, it's uh, I think about 1996, somewhere right. uh, somewhere around there. It's, uh, Late 90s, yeah. First, yeah, something in that that sort of period, and then it's had obviously had a uh, second edition and the third deluxe edition following on from that. I know, well, I'm going to wave at you my deluxe edition. A beautiful, pretty coloured deluxe edition, uh, which came with a laminated play sheet. Yes. Uh, yeah. Because of all the spittle that uh, it yeah. before came. And... <laughs> Just leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful production. It's got paintings by Bob Marion and that kind of stuff yeah. in. I don't know if you can still get hold of copies of this from uh, California yeah, slash yeah, Parks. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a lovely thing. It's a really lovely thing. Uh, did you actually update any of the rules uh, for this deluxe edition, Dave? And if so, can you remember what you did? Yeah, actually, the one of the things it was it was the move uh, to change some of the aspects in deluxe was to simplify uh, things like the shooting, uh, etc. So under the old um, uh, general brigade, you know, it's looking up figures, not dissimilar. You know, how many figures you got firing on X score? Yeah. Why? And I just brought it down in deluxe into right. Let's just focus on the formations that are firing and not the number of figures. Uh, uh, right. So you would just have, you know, a column of divisions that has its own casualty line. Mm. Uh, then it has kind of my small line, medium line, large line, and they all followed in. Uh, and and it's that was kind of the the beginning of the journey that led on to uh, the kind of the general dame, etc. Yeah, yeah. They kind of move away from concentrating or counting figures. Yeah. You know, the number of figures, which is very much you know in line with Gilda and etc old school yeah and, yes, middle, and indeed middle school yeah yes, it's a, and concentrating on just simply what is the unit's formation yeah. uh, and what is what is the unit's kind of casualty or morale state yeah. that's the only modifier right. uh, and go from there so d uh, so general brigade the deluxe version was the kind of the, the start of that journey as we uh, moving towards general domain because that that's kind of um interesting because one of the things that's often you know asked of a rule set mm. is what level of command is this pitched at and and that perennial problem where you get war gamers who want to be both the, the corporal in the front line <laughs> and the field marshal right yeah where for, for decades uh you know you, and you've mentioned in passing some rule sets there where you know, not only do I want to be saying, right, I want that brigade to go there. In fact, I want to bring in this division as a reserve and <laughs> slam it there. But also, oh, ooh, I want to do the cavalry charge, please. And yes. I've, got, I've got nine lancers and they're charging against infantry, not in square. So that's plus seven. Da, 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 da. Oh, Write them and down. Roll 25 dice. And, oh, and then, oh, yes. Same. You know, it's one of those things that... Um, Funnily enough, I was kind of conscious of, uh, you know, when, in my you know book, the the Shotstein and Stone rules of mine that were in the Wargaming Compendium. I was kind of conscious of, well, yeah, I know this isn't really how I want to be playing, but Wargamers are kind of used to that. So, you know, that you, one has to acknowledge that people do want to decide, yeah, I want to form square now and I want to be there when we're facing them coming in. And, oh, look, unlimber. I want that battery to under. I'm not going to trust that the artillery commanders are going to know what the, their job is, right? <laughs> uh, I just, I, I want to do the unlimbering and placing and aiming in that direction and specifically saying, I want to, oh, at medium range, da da da, -da. Oh, that's yeah. plus one, that's minus. It's that kind of. So that, that rule set I deliberately pitched to kind of say to potential newcomers to the hobby, you're going to get a lot of this. So if you if you play my rules a couple of times, anything else you encounter won't feel too unfamiliar. You'll say, yeah. oh, right, it's the morale stage, test uh, test stage and all the rest of it. But there is that thing, and I think that's quite an interesting, it sounds like you've come on an interesting journey yourself in, in that regard, where it is, look, you are the general you're napoleon right you are not uh 
Sergeant Bourgogne, you are Napoleon, <laughs> right? And therefore, the kind of command responsibilities you have are these. And yeah. therefore, the kind of orders you'll issue are these. Lower down the line, that's really not your concern. And so finding mechanisms, rules mechanisms, that kind of give you sufficient, the kind of feedback that a general would get rather than oh my god corporal jones has just been hit in the knee right <laughs> i mean i've got uh, there's two things i think about uh, designing war games that the, that you can consider on that that's what you said is is, is right but this, first of all war gamers love doing all that kind of stuff isn't yeah, it yeah. there isn't i don't think there's a, there isn't a war gamer out there who doesn't want to get his hands on that french heavy cavalry that's about to ride something down the caribbeans <laughs> That's it, yes, that's what you know. That's why uh, war games kind of paint the units. They paint them at the the scale that many of them are. We want to get down in the dirt at times and roll the dice because, yeah. after all, if we don't do it, actually the model soldiers aren't. So we're going to have to get down there <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and and start doing stuff. And then there was a uh, a bit of uh, another aspect that I came out that uh, from kind of research for the various rules is that. If you pitch a war game at a kind of divisional-ish level, whether you have a divisional general or even a corps commander, mm. you could say, oh, well, you know, uh, corps commanders or divisional generals only do uh, X. They only give orders and then they sit back and they have lunch and have a, you know, <laughs> yeah. nibble on a chicken wing. Uh, but actually, I think there's an awful lot of leaders, uh, not only in the Napoleonic times, but all through all periods and now, as most mm. of us will probably know, that micromanage yeah, yeah, yeah. and they don't really trust captain hyde to get that battery in the right place mm. so uh so what uh, general picton does whatever is he does ride down just to make sure that captain hyde's got that battery and many managers and we've probably all met them will then go Yes, uh, Hyde, that's that's not too bad. Just move them over to the right six feet. I prefer yeah, them yeah. to be at that angle. I mean, we even... I can remember being on exercise once when we were uh, kind of all, you know, in some godforsaken, you know, place on Salisbury Plain or wherever. Um, and they had that thing of where, you know, the top brass come along to, to see how things are going because they're running the exercise. Yeah. So, you know, so some egg on legs comes along and we're all lying down there and he starts redirecting where our... You know, our GPMG should be, you know, or the SS should be in an SF role. Get up that up, you know, get that over there. Yeah. And you, of course, you at the time, you're going, yes, sir, yes, sir. Yeah, get that done, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's micromanaging. So you can, if you can, it's not completely the same, but take that down and go, that's what war gamers are. Yeah, yeah. We like micromanaging yeah. our brigades, our divisions, or whatever. Because we want to get our hands on the tiger tank or we'll get our hands on, as you yeah. say, the carabineer. I want to be the one who moves them up. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can you can kind of go, look, there is a link uh, to, you know, to, to real life, to realism. And therefore, yeah, we can get away with that. Yeah, know, yeah, and have yeah. both have, have your cake and eat it as far as war gaming goes i mean a, a real life example from a later bit colonel h jones in the falklands of course absolutely yeah. yeah picking up a machine gun and charging forward and yep. pay, pay the ultimate price for it yes i went <laughs> off and, and actually bought a book about uh, that episode that kind of debunks the heroism of colonel h jones yeah. it's disappeared somewhere uh, but yes that kind of thing that kind of episode um I can think of, I mean, God, going back to when I was a kid, we always had wanted the prettiest unit on the table. Yes. You know, <laughs> I, I've just, I've just painted those Highlanders, mm. so I'm really concerned about what happens to yeah. them. That's, it. That, that's, that, it. That, that's not just a raw horse artillery battery. That's Mercer's, <laughs> Mercer's <laughs> Royal Horse Artillery Battery, and it's my Royal Horse Artillery yeah. Battery. And exactly, yes, and that you mentioned there, yes, I think actually, yes, could you just move it like a couple of degrees to the left? Yeah, I think you that's, know, a, that's yeah. a better aiming yeah. point over there. That's it, you uh, should be aiming at those. Yeah. I know, back in the days when, you know, like Bruce Quarry, I remember all the artillery had to be mounted on equilateral triangle bases. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. so, you know, heaven forbid that your target of choice should be just outside. Because I also remember there was those Bruce Quarry rules. 
and I, I, anyone who's baffled listening to this, surely you must remember this, the Airfix Guide to Napoleonic War game that came out in 74 or what it was, uh, followed by uh, his uh, Napoleon's campaigns in miniatures. That one there. Yeah, that, hold it. That one. That's, oh, that one. I've got like three or four yeah. different editions of it, yeah. mate. That's how much of a nutter <laughs> I was. But when it, when it came to... Um, kind of moving artillery at all you know changing its arc there was a fearsome little table about oh you've moved it that number of degrees it's going to take off this proportion of the move available for firing oh well a fifth of a move a seventh of a move you know a ninth of a move or whatever it was and it's like oh my god so that oh right so the casualties inflicted should be 71 so there but i've got to lose a ninth of that and what's a ninth of 71 and and you know it was mad it was completely mad but yes it kind of uh, pandered to the obsession that particularly young lads have for that kind of detail. <laughs> but yes, as we were saying, I think that's uh, this is something that does actually endlessly fascinate me, and it fascinates mm-hmm. me when I come across a game of any kind where there's a, a much higher level of abstraction, like say yeah. Commands and Colors, you know, the, the yeah. board yeah. crossover kind of board game. One of the things that I have to acknowledge in myself, there is this kind of jolt that God, you know, that is so abstracted at times that. Oh, is that really what I want from a game? And so you yeah. do have to say, well, okay, at this point, I, I have to put this other head on, which says that is just a game. And I, therefore its outcome, I don't, it doesn't affect me as much as if it was, say, one of those Bruce Quarry Napoleonic games yeah. where, you know, you learnt your 33 times table. <laughs> you could <laughs> Very do well. it. So this is quite <laughs> interesting. So the, looking at the Napoleonic you know, game and and obviously uh, uh, General de Brigade has more recently morphed into and he's looking for his copy to copy to wave pointlessly at the camera because only Dave can see. <laughs> and I'm slightly proud of this, of course, because I did the design and layout. You did, you did very well. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Thank you, David. The the beautiful General Darme, uh, War Games Rules for Battles in the Age of Napoleon by David C. R. Brown, published now by Ricewitz Press, which we'll kind of talk a bit. About more about later but um so w- w- why general d'arme i mean it's obviously previously it was general de brigade this the title kind of is that a clue to the kind of move that you were making f- f- up from yeah. uh, to a higher level of command structure yeah I, I to be perfectly honest if i could have called it general de division i would have done that but there's already said a war game draw oh those. right <laughs> that's it but yeah the Nailed idea was the french say it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's to is to move it up a scale to enable uh, either the same size battles or bigger battles to be played more, more quickly uh, in a in a more streamlined format and to to take it away from figure counting and those sort of uh design elements of rules yeah. and concentrate a bit more on the the things that perhaps Napoleonic commanders uh, had to concentrate on, like yeah, yeah. Um, getting your troops up quickly, uh, directing your uh, our artillery to redouble its efforts or bringing up the fresh fresh reserves. Yeah. Or uh, And I know I'm, you know, probably all, some people will say this isn't right, but reinforcing the, the skirmish line, you know, to put, put out a heavy skirmish line. Mm. Deliberately put in lots of uh, potential tactics in General Darme that uh, I've hopefully picked up over the years from reading and research that mm. said, well, actually, battles in the Napoleonic warfare were more, it's kind of basically three phases. You'd have the artillery phase, mm. the skirmish phase, which was a significant phase, mm. and then the kind of close order infantry or cavalry phase. Yeah. And it's commanding those three phases and of course then releasing reserves at the right point and at the right time mm. would, would be the kind of the, the final uh, aspect to any kind of command and control so it's about it was moving away from orders that just simply said engage assault mm. into things what are the actually is the commander wanting these people to do Mm. we're going to launch an assault, assault over there therefore i want the artillery to bombard that with some effect mm. get on with it mm. so off they go uh, and off they do that it was um and it was it's also along with the the kind of my journey my journey into friction as you could say uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which 
which uh, it's I guess you said more on later in the, the movie to rise its press, but I was becoming more and more influenced by uh, things going wrong uh, in the military for which I've not only uh, seen in in yeah, various operations. Yeah, yeah. That's right. See, see, and it was just and one of the things that that kind of cemented it for me. We played a great uh, uh, game uh, of Asper Nestling. Uh, where we had some fantastic uh, armors. The chaps are beautifully painted Austrian mm. army. But of course, we, we were the French and we were we said, right, we, we can defeat them because as their attacks come in, we'll send the Imperial Guard as the fire brigade to go from A to B mm. and they'll reinforce, defeat, and then we'll re-establish. And that was our mm. tactic. Mm. But unbeknown to us, the Austrians had decided to form a huge semicircle across Asper and Essling and advance every single battalion at exactly the same speed and the same pace. Oh, my God. So, so if you imagine this whole Napoleonic army just advanced, you know, in a classic, whatever, six inches, all together. Six oh, my inches, God. All together. And, of course, the French strategy or tactics went out the window, thought, oh, this is not going right. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> and we were soundly thrashed, as you would expect in, in that kind of battle. But that really did lead to some serious thinking and discussion about friction. Because yeah, you went, yeah. yeah, hang on, that was the equivalent of whatever, a hundred thousand men, all advancing in parade ground. Condition. Yeah, that's it. And even you know, and even you know, even on the parade ground, it doesn't go perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Even now, I, I've had the uh, the kind of good fortune to do trooping on the colour on a good number of occasions because that was my thing, and uh, I was determined to get involved in numerous aspects of it. Oh, so, right. When, yeah, so when you're doing the colonel's review or whatever, there's about two or three um, preps to Trooping of the Colour. Yeah, yeah. They have to prepare that in quite some detail. Oh, God, yes. At, about to, so bringing on uh, the guards uh, and to get it right. So even to the extent there are you have kind of markers on the parade ground. Absolutely, so you know, yeah. Yeah, so when you want to halt, there's the marker to halt, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and it was talking... So as the, my, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to so you can talk to uh, some of the people involved in, in setting it all up. You can talk to the, the lifeguards about uh, cavalry horses and what yeah, yeah. cavalry horses are capable of. Yeah. And also the, they've got the, the Royal Horse Artillery Troop. Absolutely. So yeah, King's have Troop. A, yeah, that's it. Have a, ha, have a chat with them. How do you deploy? How easy is it? Et cetera, et cetera. And, it's, and that gave me some, uh, some great insights into... Uh, your troops Napoleonic essentially because that's yeah. pretty much what yeah. they are uh, and how they deploy and how difficult it was yeah, so yeah. if you think the foot guards have spent a month or whatever practicing trooping yeah. of the cover well how well then is a an Austrian unit that you know that's just come out of the depot and marched onto Austerlitz going to do when it's yeah. being shot at yeah um, so hence that it's kind of the, the journey into into kind of friction that, I mean, what you're talking about there, it's wonderful. God, I wish I'd been with you. Cause I, I've been to see um, was it the Major General's Review, which is review. kind of the yeah. prequel to uh, yeah, The Colour, which is the following yeah. week or whatever. Mm. Um, and just being there watching it live, yeah. is the most extraordinary thing because, first of all, uh, it gives you an incredible impression impression of the the sheer power of yeah. big units of that kind you yep. actually feel the ground move yeah you know, shaking yeah. when when the the lifeguards come on when the you know the, the the raw horse artillery comes on oh my god i mean these are things of course that weigh many tons plus you've got a mm. team of six pulling them when they deploy in green park to do the kind of the salute yeah. after trip yep. it's the most incredible thing isn't it oh yeah. my god the 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 the, the king's troop at full gallop into deployment is just something i think every war game should get to see at yeah, least once yeah the size of the lifeguard horses yeah. oh, <laughs> well, my <that's> <laughs> oh my god oh my god they're huge that's it i had a uh, uh, i cornered one once one of the uh, officers and we had a good discussion about uh, you know the history of the lifeguards bar you know etc waterloo that's always you rope them all in because they mm. you know that's their regimental history and we're looking at the guy, isn't it? So he's on a horse that's absolutely massive. He's Probably got, 18 or 19. Yes, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. He's got 
uh, boots on that go all the way up. He's yeah. got he's in a leather or sheepskin uh, saddle cloth that covers all the tops of his legs. Then there's the cuirass. Then there's the helmet and all the epaulets and all the, the garbage that goes around it. Yeah. And he was saying, really, we're pretty well protected. Yeah. And we had discussions about, you know, that classic war games thing as old cavalry don't charge directly into in, into people, etc. And there are, without giving too much away, there are tactics that the lifeguards uh, or, and the blues of wars or whatever they are now, they're all amalgamated, mm. um, would use under certain situations to get uh, HMQ out of any dangerous situations mm. and and the people we were talking to in the day had no hesitation whatsoever that didn't matter how f- dense the crowd was what they were armed with they would smash through them all and mm. come out the other side mm. you know they had no doubt about that that's what they were trained to do mm-hmm. and their horses wouldn't shy away mm. and they'd just smash hell out of anything that was in the way mm. and you thought yeah fairly useful stuff yeah, yeah. <laughs> one one of the things that to, uh, dwelling on cavalry for a minute since obviously we're, we're enjoying this discussion uh, one of the things that imp, uh, impressed me uh, was a few years ago went to uh, southern Spain with Annie yeah. the other half went mm-hmm. to the Spanish riding school at Jerez oh, where mm-hmm. they train their horses in what is basically the cavalry manoeuvres of the 17th century including and, and these are beautiful big white Andalusian and horses just gorgeous to look at but uh, and the riders of course are incredible because they're wearing these sort of 17th 18th century uh, costume and uniform and the rider basically the, the, their their objective is to remain effectively immobile in the saddle you cannot tell that they are giving that horse any orders whatsoever when it suddenly stops and goes into reverse and dances a pirouette and all the rest of it but the thing is that these maneuvers of course were taught to m- cavalry horses Mm. And things like the the, the famous manoeuvre where they get the horse to jump and kick to front and back. (laughs) Oh my God, I would not want to be in the way of that. And of course, that's a great way if a cavalryman does, or or, you know, mounted policeman presumably found themselves surrounded by a crowd and thought, I got to get out of here. Well, a little nudge on the horse and oh my God, you've probably got two to four people with their brains smashed out (laughs) to either end and off you go. And people forget that. Yes. I mean, there are, uh, horses of a particular type that have only had a certain amount of training and yes famously if you send them up against a hedge of bayonets that's what squares were for they're not going to yeah, go through yeah. but yeah. there are things that can be done by a cavalryman who's extremely well trained and yeah. a horse that's extremely well trained yep. that are yeah. not you know the the stuff of the average mount and rider yeah. Yeah. so but you know that's an interesting point you made there Dave. and we're kind of getting off off, off, off the, the rules. Surely not. Thing. Surely not. <laughs> because what we've done is, having talked about how we're talking about, oh yes, the grand tactical stuff, we've gone right down into the minutiae of how... because <laughs> we're war gamers, we love it. <laughs> <laughs> of how a cavalryman could get out of the middle of a crowd. <laughs> Fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. You know, quad era demonstrandum, yes. I think. Um, but the, so the, um, sticking with the General Darmay then, yep. for a minute, because obviously I think this is kind of... It must have been quite a big transition for you because General Brigade was a very popular rule set. I mean, I've no idea how many copies it sold, but it certainly became kind of the ubiquitous post gilder kind of Napoleonic rule set that whenever I went to a show or anyone to, oh, what are you playing? Napoleonics, what are you playing? Oh, we're playing General de Brigade, right? I mean, you, that you must have realised and perhaps were surprised by the kind of, if you like, the depth of penetration that that rule set had, right? Yeah, I, I was. I think I've liked most of the war games. You write a set, set of war games rules, and it, it gets uh, put out into the press, and you you think, well, I've stuck my head above the para, parapet. I'm probably going to get shot at, but you know, hey, give it a go. Let's give it a run. And I was, I was, you know, pleasantly surprised, and and a, and a big surprise that uh, a number of people bought it, and then they came back and they said, I really enjoyed that. I think they're really good. Uh, and I thought, and it really did come back. It was a bit of a shock. You think, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, you really, you, you, you play a generative game. B, you really like them. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it was extremely satisfying. And it, it, it kind of, um, I was I was grateful for the fact that perhaps all the, you know, the work and the research, et cetera, you put, you, you put into them actually paid off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, all the, and, all, and all the play testing. So it was, um, 
Uh, it, it, was, it, it was extremely, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to have a set of rules that people enjoy and play. Because uh, the evidence for that, I remember when I was you know, in the early days of battle games, so, you know, the mid-2000s onwards, um, looking around for what was out there on on tinternets you know when it was still we have to cast our minds back you know 12 13 years wargaming still wasn't massively established on the internet you know it was it was get things were popping up but one of the things i remember from you know quite early on was you had a forum you were running a general to brigade forum on yeah. on a website i mean probably you know uh, one of the very early forum types of company bb edit or whatever it was back in the day <laughs> but there was there was a forum going and it was really heavily populated and it was very active and in fact i seem to recall it was because i i kind of stumbled onto that that i found out about the 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 big weekend games. South yeah, yeah, being yeah. organized there and it's like oh my god there are hundreds and hundreds of people here what the <laughs> hell's going on uh, i mean that that must have been quite interesting for you being able to get access to the people who were reading and using your rules you know not just locally but worldwide in a way that i'm struggling to think of any other rule sets other than you know run by the big company yeah the big company that yeah. had that kind of penetration but it's it, it was it's one of the things i think isn't it that if you write a set of rules i i think this is my personal take that you're kind of obligated to support it mm. uh, and people will naturally have questions your writing style is you know is will be perfectly uh, clear to or well, I don't know, 10%. <laughs> Everyone yeah. else will go, I'm not too sure. I can sort of understand what you're getting. Yeah, uh, yeah. As you know about writing, isn't it? It's it's yeah. it's fairly subjective in the way you phrase stuff. Uh, and I think, well, it's, not, yeah, it's part of my job to provide answers to people. They're going to ask a question. Well, what's wrong with giving giving an answer? And one of the things I certainly didn't want to do was to that dreaded thing where you would, uh, and, and the kind of pre-internet days, where you would have to send in a letter and a oh, stamped God. address return envelope, yes, whatever they were. That's yes, yes. um, you know, yeah. it. Uh, yeah, you know, it'd be, dear Mr. X, could mm. you know, infantry firing at 100 yards and you get a kind of a, a yes or no answer back. That's all they would do. Yeah. And I think I, I wanted to go above and beyond that. I thought I'm not going anywhere near that. Uh, that's not what I would want mm. if I'm playing a set of rules. I would want someone to... Uh, respond uh, to me on the phone, give answers, give you know demos, give pictures. How do I do stuff? Mm. And that's it. And I think that's what that's what you do. And I think that's one of the the benefits of the internet. The benefits of having the, those forums is the fact you can interact, you can give that support, and obviously you can tell people right, okay, this is what we're going to have a we're going to have a mega game, we're going to have a weekend game, mm. and what you you try not to do is always re- restrict it to your particular club or mm. group is just put it out there yeah, yeah, and so yeah. we would have games where people would come down from scotland uh, we even had one bloke that was over from new zealand at one of our games he timed it very nicely yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so he was there but people from scotland wales all over the place would come down for a large games we had um big games in the uh, national Army museum for quite a few years we were quite privileged privileged to get in there before we moved on to uh, south mims and then on to the war games holiday center but all that i think helps isn't it it yeah, says yeah. that you're there and you're available and we're willing to play games with anyone yeah, yeah. Uh, you know and if you've got comments and suggestions well great i'm you know I, i'm certainly not the panacea of all things napoleonic or all things napoleonic rule writing if you've got a good idea and it sounds about right Okay, well, let's use it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, mean, it. I, I, I was <clears throat> smiling to myself there and thinking, you know, gosh, um, even worse than what you described, where you'd have to write into one of the war games magazines, like Battle for War Gamers. Yeah. Dear, dear editor, in the letters page, I've been trying to uh, WRG fourth edition, and this uh, I don't understand what you do with these rompfier things. <laughs> could could Mr. Barker please explain you know what happens? And then you hope that Mr. Barker spotted the letter in the letters page, <laughs> or the editor's gone and tapped on Phil's shoulder or dropped him a line or whatever and eventually two this. or three months yeah. later you might get a response yeah, absolutely fantastic what those were the days eh? those were the days I, I'm, can you think you know this kind of 
instant feedback that we kind of take for granted now because uh, not just on forums, you know, but now, of course, you can mention something on Twitter, say, yeah. and yeah. wow, th th within seconds, you've got a response <laughs> to it. I mean, it's mind boggling sometimes. And, and I think scary. So, some extent can be scary, overwhelming. I think this mm. is the thing that sometimes it can be overwhelming. As I discovered recently, the the things that you post that get the most response sometimes can be really surprising as yes. well really surprising um uh listeners may know what I, i'm talking about when i mention footgate that happened on <laughs> twitter dave's kind of looking blank at this um i've been losing weight dave you might have noticed down looking of down course the camera, uh, looking you so look good yeah. you. thank you darling but um I've been losing weight and I, I broke this kind of milestone. I got under 18 stone and in my excitement and joy, I just did a little photo of me standing on the scales. Now looking down, oh, look, it's yes, it's 17 stone 13 or whatever it is. Oh, uh, because I've been trying to kind of encourage other war gamers to get off the backsides and lose some weight, you know. <laughs> and this little photo fairly oh, quickly no. got a couple of kind of <laughs> hateful responses. Oh, I don't want to see your feet in my <laughs> timeline kind of thing. It's like, oh my God, steady on, mate. God, it's only it's only feet, right? I've been very careful about my camera mm. angles, right? It's only oh, my feet. thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> only feet. Well, what happened was there was a whole bunch of my, you know, my tweeps, my friends on Twitter who came on in support. It was absolutely fantastic. And suddenly uh, the, the timeline was flooded with war gamers posting pictures of their own feet with the hashtag stand with Henry. And it started <laughs> trending on Twitter for, you know, 24 hours. Can you believe this? Of all the things, you know, sod Brexit and everything else and Trump and everything else that's going on in the world. This, these pictures of war gamers feet were trending on Twitter temporarily. It was completely fantastic. And as I commented afterwards, you know, my mum always said I'd be a footnote in history, oh, but <laughs> grown. <laughs> but of all the things, you know, over, over all the years, all the writing I've done and everything else that I thought I might, you know, make something popular on Twitter, my damn feet was the last thing I imagined would be it. But, you know, that's just a humorous example. But, of course, it can go the other way where suddenly you discover that you've got haters out there. This is the other thing about the Internet. Your set of rules is rubbish and da -da 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 and all that kind of stuff. So you, you do. There's pros and cons. You get the instant feedback, but you get the instant feedback. Right. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things. And, you, and it's kind of out of your control. But can you think of. Uh, anything specific to do with, say, General to Brigade, where because of the feedback you've received from your broader community, uh, kind of outside your immediate club members, that you, has actually made you think, oh, yeah, probably that isn't working and I should, you know, tweak that. Is there anything you can think of? Yeah, I, there's a, a kind of a, a number of aspects where I think people come, come back to you and they go, uh, they will play your rules in a, in a different way to the way you play and that you you haven't seen before because yeah. obviously you're, we're, we're quite restricted in our in our little groups even though you can go out and war game with others yeah. but when you're there it tends to become your game yeah. and other people will play it completely differently oh, yeah. Uh, and they yeah and they will come back and say well you know, uh, uh, you know, you should think. Well, maybe this should be uh, the orders sh uh, should be different, or artillery should, you know, be able to do this. Uh, rockets is always the classic. Right. You think I'll, you know, I'll have a set of won't put rockets in, but then everyone wants rockets. And then <laughs> some, they'll come up with some with some good ideas. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's been people have continually uh, come up with good ideas and good suggestions, and they either become merged into the kind of the second edition of the uh, second edition mm. g to b or, or deluxe one or you think actually that is a good idea uh but it doesn't need to sit in the rules uh, themselves and let's just expand the optional rules mm. so uh the the main rules stay fairly slick and, and fairly quick so people can kind of crack on hopefully and get through them quickly but all the options for the people want all the little extras that people think well okay prussian whatever grenadiers should be able to do this. And you think, actually, you're right. The research says they did do that. Yeah. Let's put all those into the optional rules. And that's where you see there's lo it's quite a bit of mm. optional rules that, that come out and, and support all those suggestions. Brilliant. Uh, well, that's really good to hear. And I think that it, uh, it, people find it encouraging when a rules writer does listen to what they're saying. I mean, you know, my Shot, Steen and Stone one, I've got a tiny Facebook group. 
bless everyone who's you know signed up for it but even there as you say it's like god i would never have thought of reading yeah. that rule that way or yeah. god how many times was this proofread by how many people and we still <laughs> missed that how is that possible it you know it's just part of the publishing process quite apart from the rules writing process yeah. um, i just wanted to say you know before we kind of move away from general de brigade and uh, general diamond uh, as a pair um people should know that alongside the rule sets uh, over the years i've lost count of how many there were five six seven eight i've lost track uh books uh, produced by um caliber books parties and press of napoleonic scenarios mm. Mm. uh and there's loads of them and i've just got what four here i've got uh, number five which is wellington's victories number three which is the glory years 1800 to 1809 number two which is all sorts of bits and pieces i can't remember what's in there and and the original one napoleonic scenarios uh and they're incredibly useful because of course one of the things that people you know often say is right i've got this set of rules i've got my soldiers now what yeah. do i do with them and of course scenarios are to my mind the next best thing to playing a campaign you know i i'm you know obviously wedded as people know I'm <laughs> nearly finished oh guys <laughs> nearly, i'm so agonizingly close to finishing my book about campaigns but you know in it i do mention that actually if nothing else just do a series of linked campaigns even if it's just some mm. kind of club league system or something like yep. that because it just gives a raison d'etre for you know what you're doing on the table and of course, there's some, you know, a lot of the scenarios you've done are based on real battles. I mean, I'm looking here, we've got Barossa, 1811, Albuera, there's a good one, 1811, Attack on the Chevrolet, no Redoubt, 1812, and so on and so on and so forth. So uh, that must have been a huge amount of work, Dave, to kind of extract scenarios from, what, oh God, how many battles, thousands of potential <laughs> historical encounters? I mean, I, I think uh, we I was quite lucky, and it might be a bit of serendipity coming into play, that when I picked on the size of uh, General Dribble Brigade to be, and General Darmay, so you've got a division or a division plus for General mm. Darmay, those uh, actions in the Napoleonic period and uh, the ACW would often be quite distinct. Mm. So you could, you could, for instance, take, uh, as, as we've already mentioned, you could take Durlon's uh, attack at Waterloo, that was done in pretty much isolation. Isn't mm. it? There wasn't much going on, True, say, yeah. in the British centre, etc. So you, you can take that section in, in relative isolation and then just re reproduce it. And you can do the same with uh, Borodino. Uh, we uh, played the other day. We had a, uh, a, a good scenario around the Utitsa flank, which is often yeah. uh, ignored but isolated. Again, the, the Grand Redoubt. And you can just, so you go, I'll just take that slice of history and and carry on carry on like mm. like like that just take slice and slice and slice mm. and it's easy and it's it, fairly easy to produce the the time with scenario books is playing the games yes yes because yes. if you you put 10 or more scenarios into a book you have to play them all once uh, and then you'll get all the feedback well oh, i didn't work it needs a bit longer or whatever yeah, yeah, then yeah. you have to play them all again uh, uh, and then you um generally it's the third time so they just think that's 30 games to get a scenario book out and and as you say uh, that takes some time to do yeah i mean something uh, i've encountered because i'm um for my gladius publications thing which has kind of lain dormant for a couple of years now and i want to kind of give it a <laughs> kick up the backside and get it moving one of the things i i thought uh was you know i could do books of scenarios and of course mm. it's, it's for me i mean one of the things as you know um and people know i, I love doing maps so coming up with maps for a scenarios for me i can just boom 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 i love doing it then of course you are faced with yeah structuring the f balanced forces mm -hmm. to go to play the scenario with and then play testing that scenario as you say multiple times because it is sod's law that if you've only play tested it once and you send it out there and you think oh yeah that'll, that'll do fine and guaranteed that you know day one Don't someone's going to come back and say well that was rubbish <laughs> you know I, I, lost, I lost in two moves what the hell were you thinking you know god having allowing them to put the paratroopers on my baseline that was really stupid or whatever you know <laughs> i mean that's why in the with with doing a, a, a series of of 
campaign uh, booklets with um, through Rice Fitz Press with Rich Clark, and we've cut those down to six. Right. Because six is still enough, uh, hopefully enough scenarios for people to, to get their teeth into and play, but it's much more manageable to produce, especially <coughs> yeah, in a kind yeah, of PDF yeah. format. So you can just go, good, six from there. Playing through six games is, yeah, and getting them done is a lot easier and a lot yeah, quicker. Yeah. So you're just able to produce more. Yeah. Brilliant. So those, those scenarios, I recommend those to people because I'm, I'm quite certain that they're still available from Calibre Books for sure. Uh, and um, I can't remember how much Dave, Dave overcharges. I mean, charges for them. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure there are bargains to be had. Dave, Dave's a man who'll do you a deal. Uh, and they are invaluable. And, uh, you know, particularly I've got the one there which focuses on, you know, Peninsula War stuff for me, which is, you know, my favourite, my favourite. Yep. Um, and and you know fantastic the the general Dame book um quite apart from being a, a very beautifully love lovely thing i i was really interested in what you were saying there about this um uh, journey you've taken in the way that the 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 rules produce a more realistic kind of tactical um tableau if you like mm. and you took as you say you mentioned about kind of the artillery bombardment fo followed by this thing that as you say often gets overlooked which is this kind of thick skirmish line mm. that in yeah. many napoleonic battles kind of developed that curiously is not hugely unlike what happened in the later kind of american civil war yeah, where yeah, you know exactly. both yeah. lines opposing each other and we'll talk about mm -hmm. pickett's charge in a minute but both lines kind of developed this thick skirmish line uh, and was really rather flexible about oh right there's an opportunity there so back into close order oh no you know we need to spread out cash is yeah. you know yeah. um uh, followed by that coup d'oeil isn't it when's the moment to transform to your line yeah. and yep. go at yeah. that weak point as your artillery work together well with your skirmish line have you got your troops deployed in the right places but you know and then your heavy cavalry reserve or whatever it happens to be ready to go at that moment you know this is yeah. one of the things i find so exciting about napoleonic games is when it comes together you know it really comes together now I've talked endlessly. People are bored of hearing me talk about my Salamanca at the War Games Holiday <laughs> Centre all those years ago. But that was one of those moments for me that still I still feel quite emotional about. It. I'm, I'm actually I so, can tell. I'm actually quite <laughs> choking up slowly to thinking about it yeah. because it doesn't happen very often in a war gaming life, yeah, does it? Really. Where you are because I was Marmon <clears throat> and I had just the reserve i all i had my six or seven whatever it was divisional commanders uh, uh, in doing all the stuff they did and that was quite interesting you know that that command structure thing because we actually did stick to quite a rigid command structure part an interesting point where um and i've kind of discussed this with rich and nick of two fat lardies as well where mm -hmm. it's that crossover point where uh, how at what point do you introduce mechanisms rules mechanisms to impose a certain kind of behavior on the players yeah, yeah. to impose friction on the players and how much can you rely on the players themselves providing perfectly enough friction thank you very <laughs> bloody much right which in my experience is you know, quite a lot of the time the latter actually and certainly you know i've it's, you see reports of some of the big games from the war games holiday center and i've witnessed them you know when doing the don yeah. feather same weekends where it's just chaos everyone's out for themselves and no one really kind of gives a damn and it takes a, a quite an effort of personality to impose and maintain that's the other thing maintain a a proper command structure now on that day let's just say i was incredibly lucky the right players in the right game and the right place doing the right things they all remarkably thought i knew what i was talking about they all <laughs> remarkably carried out my orders almost to the letter you know basically yeah. creating that sort of gap in the middle of the, of the hinge of the british line through which i then launched my uh, dragoons and horse artillery and we just Beautiful. blew the British position <laughs> apart and it was it was a thing of beauty and it was really <laughs> I was utterly choked it was extraordinary and I've never repeated it <laughs> let me make that clear. Yeah. never repeated but there is this interesting thing as I say where uh, 
here, obviously with General Darme, you're um, you're creating mechanisms that you, I presume, you all the best you can do is hope that that yeah. um, enables the players to get a more accurate representation of what would have happened historically. Uh, but to, to, you know, how conscious are you of the limitations of, if you like, the the ability and temperament of the players versus the mechanisms in the rules that you're creating? Yeah, we, you've, you've got to kind of go that players are all different, aren't they? They're, they're going to come in from every angle possible. You're going to have your your uh, kind of lawyer, mathematician, planning everything ahead. And, you, OK, you'll have to deal with them. And you've got your other side of the coin, who's the war gamer that doesn't really think much. He just throws some troops forward, throws the dice and goes, uh, you know, am I doing that right? Mm. And so... I, I, what I try to do is is, is to d design rules that sit kind of in the middle of those, so that all the war gamers can that you can play a set of rules and you can understand or have one foot in that camp, so you can get it. Mm -hmm. So you can go. It might not be perfectly to your liking, and and some of the players may not quite, get, but they'll understand where it's coming from. Mm. Uh, and at the other end of the scale, where you've got you just chuck some dice and let's get some troops forward, it won't impose too much upon their pleasure, you know, which is throwing troops forward and having a laugh, because it's it it's just enough for them to be able to cope with. If yeah. you go too far one way, then you know you'll probably alienate thirty percent of your players or more because mm. they'll have to become too involved. Um, it needs to be pitched at the right. Level. And I think Rich Clark's also mentioned on this thing. The rules you need to try as best you can to be rule, to have rules that are vaguely intuitive, so that yeah. people kind of get them without referring to the books and referring to the rules. And if the rules are kind of also related to the period, so it's, it feels Napoleonic, you feel like you're doing um, carrying out Napoleonic actions, then mm. it's easier for the players to understand it and, and just carry it through, mm. so they can just. It, it, hopefully all those pieces then then fall together and, and the players can enjoy uh, a war game that has at least a foot within you know napoleonic realism mm. as, as best one can in a war game mm. uh, w one of the things that um i'm sitting here thinking about obviously you are um you know a, a big reader of history aren't you mm. Mm. Uh, and one of the things that to me comes out of your uh, uh, certainly napoleonic rule sets is your deep and ab abiding love of the period that it's a yeah. it's a period of history you're passionate about that you kind of get right and and i think that's one of those things isn't it that when you're writing a rule set effectively you're also you're creating a manifesto for mm. how you view that period a, a manifesto for how you want that period to be represented on the war games table um and uh, that always fascinates me because obviously uh the kind of things that you're trying to represent are the ebb and flow of the big battle yeah right and that's clearly i mean going way back to you know a couple of hours ago to the beginning of our conversation <laughs> when when we we were talking about kind of the gilder effect the war games holiday mm -hmm. center effect and those books you know the david chandler books the big battle yeah. paintings you know i was talking to uh, to sid the other week wasn't i about her yeah. love of the 17th century and those dutch painters the big battle paintings and how what the, one of the reasons he's decided to go for two mil gaming for example is because that's the only way he's found to his liking to properly get that feel of the huge battle where there's lots going on and you get an impression of the distances involved and and, and that kind of thing uh and that i i certainly feel with you is that when i look at a game of uh a, one of the big general brigade games when i think back to that waterloo game that i came yeah. and, I, uh, and watched and stuff um i got a sense of this is an epic this is an epic encounter and that those epic encounters are the kind of things that you're constantly drawn to dave yeah. that you may love as well you know the, the the sharps rifles you know a few riflemen in the hills of spain you know duffing up a few voltageurs or whatever <laughs> right that you know as a bit of fun but what kind of turns you on as a gamer and what you want to uh, kind of imp if you like um give as a gift to 
other gamers is that love of the period represented in that way. Would that be fair to say? Uh, I think it's, you've summed that up very well, Henry. Oh, thank <laughs> you, <James. laughs> It is. I mean, uh, you know, I play all sorts of war games, but uh, you've identified the fact, you know, I play skirmish level war games or whatever, and they don't, for me, have quite the pull of... Uh, for instance, uh, ten battalions of the old guard going up the ridge at Waterloo, because it's it's for me that's kind of where I am and what I want to do. And I think yeah. right, so everything that uh, you read about, isn't it, that Napoleon it will commit the guard or Napoleon will commit this corps yeah. or that corps, and then you your research and your reading takes you through the actions of that corps as it goes up, and then even in the in a lot of the historical ac accounts they'll start with the core being released at that level yeah. which is what we do in our game yeah. uh, and then the description will move down to the end of what the individual divisions and brigades are doing yeah. and that's what we're still doing in our game yeah. and then when they're describing the action they are describing the actions of regiments battalions individual cavalry regiments yeah. and individual commanders uh, and that's what I'm attempting to recreate in, in the rules. It's mm. that kind of funnel as it's going all the way down. You follow it all the way down mm. to the kind of the pinnacle of the action at the top. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and you can get the enjoyment from all from from all of that. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking back to um, books I read. I mean, sticking with Waterloo for a moment. Uh, one of the first books about Waterloo I can remember reading was a close run thing by, was it David Howarth? Yeah, yeah. Which was, I mean, okay, we've had some criticism over the years about, you know, potential <laughs> accuracy or whatever. Yeah. But, oh my God, as a way of evoking the yeah. epic nature of Waterloo, and precisely as you described those, you, you really got a sense actually of the, the, the grand decisions being taken, yeah. but also the you're down there oh god the description of mercer's battery of rha blowing away the front of the uh, the french uh, grenadier cheval wasn't it yeah, you were yeah. trotting up to their position and they couldn't see how effective their guns had been because it was completely obscured by smoke Open and the only, noise yeah. and it was deafening and then you know they loosed off i can't remember if it was double shotted or triple shotted with canister <laughs> yes. or whatever it was <clears throat> you know just you know massive shotgun effect at mm. point blank range and the smoke disappears and there's this pile of bodies in front of them you know and this this magnificent and you, i can imagine the french grenadiers as a cheval one of the most you know elegant uh, astonishing you know striking looking units on the field and they're just yeah. turned into you know mincemeat basically um and and that sense of drama you get where as you say it's and obviously so much British military history and regimental history is built on this. It's the yeah. honour of the regiment. The regiment. You know, it's yeah. not just those yeah. two battalions. It's the 4th Warwickshires and the 7th Staffs yeah. and they're standing yeah. side by side. And, you know, it, it's just really powerful, potent stuff. And particularly when you're a young lad reading this stuff, it, yeah. there is a kind of romance. I mean, <laughs> now as an older man and you know, having done a lot more reading. Oh, that old. But, you know, and also understanding more about you know uh the, the carnage of the battlefield yeah mm. that's not funny actually you know there's not actually yeah. much not much romantic uh you know when it once you've seen it all over our television screens for real uh mm. many yeah. times and you know lots of documentaries in the front line it's like oh my god that suddenly gives you uh, a different take on all that reading you've done back then where it was cut all that stuff was glossed over it was glorious oh yes it was terrible but it was glorious you know and a few pithy quotes about oh you know, there's nothing so uh, so so uh, shocking as a bat uh, uh, compared to a battle lost as a battle won and all that yeah. kind of stuff whatever yeah. it was wellington said but it's it is that kind of um epic scale of things combined with the romance of these individual units as you say whereas getting below that oh if it's b company or whatever unless it's the b company the cold streams in Ugamont or whatever <laughs> yeah it, 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 it becomes less so so i'm kind of with you on that you know this is <clears throat> if people want to know what um the appeal of old if you like old school wargaming is to me it is those it's it's the brigades and battalions that have an identity those mm. battle honors on that unit's colors right those are important yeah. 
that's yeah. part of the literally the fabric of that unit you know what 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 it, the officers appeal to you know remember minden or whatever it happens to be i'm getting so carried away with the napoleonic <laughs> stuff here dave <laughs> But thanks for you know bringing that in because I think that is really interesting talking to you about what's inspired you about that period and to portray it in that particular way. But let's move on. I mean, because of course you're not just a Napoleonic gamer, and one of the other things that came out of your relationship with Reisewitz Press in recent years, again holding up for the ladies and gentlemen who can't oh, see it, okay. but I shall put something on the blog post when I post the thing. Uh, another very attractively designed and laid out, if I may say so, <coughs> rule set. Beautifully done. Thank you, David. <laughs> called Pickett's Charge. <laughs> Which, of course, uh, is, again, a development of an earlier ACW rule set of yours, the name of which has completely escaped me, Dave. Guns at Gettysburg. Guns at Gettysburg. Thank you. <laughs> of which, shockingly, I don't have a copy. My com collection is incomplete. I shall head off to eBay immediately. <clears throat> but Guns at Gettysburg, of course, was very much in the general to brigade kind of mould, wasn't it, Dave? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was. It was um, It was the, the my two kind of... One of my, Two favourite periods, obviously Napoleonic, and it leads uh, straight into uh, the AC, ACW. So once you've finished with Napoleonics, obviously the next step is uh, the uh, American Civil War, and that's how we uh, just moved. I tried to move many of the mechanics that that seem to work well with with General Drill Brigade uh, into into guns at Gettysburg, and um, we had. Uh, it, it, it seemed to work. It, it, we used the same order system, uh, the same figure scales, etc., uh, etc., et and mm. it just kind of fitted into the what was become known as the uh, General Brigade family of rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and now uh, we already mentioned uh, a few minutes ago how there is this kind of uh, interesting similarity between the American Civil War and uh, aspects of the Napoleonic warfare with the kind of thick skirmish line idea mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but of course the american civil war has this kind of fascination for, well for a num number of reasons and you can talk about your fascination for me it's the predominance of infantry warfare really yep. uh, and the the complete change in the way that cavalry are used compared to uh on mainland europe because of course in mainland europe at this time there's we've still got cuirassiers in mainland europe right <laughs> we've still yes. got guys you know boot to boot Bizarre, thundering across yeah, the exactly. plane yeah. increasingly getting mown down by you know advanced technology maxim guns and what have you whereas in 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 the u.s of course they they had no tradition of european style cavalry in the same way uh, there were well rush's lancers i think are one of the few new units i can think yeah. of that initially yeah. and for a very short period of time trying to kind of emulate napoleonic tactics actually with lances my goodness yeah. me uh didn't which last must, very long yeah. didn't last very long <laughs> must have been quite something to see and of course the only other troops on the american continent that have that sort of tradition you'd have to kind of head towards central and south america where yeah. of course because of the mexican influence mexican, and the french yeah. influence and so forth uh there was some more kind of european looking very colorful cavalry my god it must have been hot in those uniforms Right. <laughs> but so you've got this complete change the way cavalry are used to being sort of mounted infantry often or if there was shock tactics it was very kind of impromptu it was very kind yeah. of oh god we found ourselves oh there's some there's some rebels there we draw it quick we're so close draw your swords guys and get stuck in no. yeah. one of the few times i can think of when there was a you know, major cavalry cut with brandy station for example yeah. Yeah. um you know that's and i played a war game of that at major general john davinkovitz's places bothy uh it was a few years ago now uh, with Charles Grant was there and others and it was amazing 15 mil brandy station with many hundreds of cavalry figures you know galloping all over the place it was an amazing thing because of its rarity you know yes, as an ACW yeah. game so you've got this kind of infantry dominance you've got the, the 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 change in cavalry tactics but also of course you've got the beginning of what we would recognize as well going two ways either kind of world war one trench warfare yeah. or looking back in history back to the siege warfare of Vauban you know with people digging in the trenches reinforced and big guns and all the rest of it yeah. so that's kind of um 
where my interest in the period comes in but you know tell us about you know what it is that kind of turns you on about the period Dave. It's, it's what got it for me isn't it it is primarily uh, an infantryman's war in mm. uh, the AC the ACW and it's that the fact that they are still pretty much uh, Napoleonic in their outlook uh, but perhaps not in their tactics because mm. I think they learned pretty quickly um, that uh, with, with the, the firearms as they were and the fact that I, I don't think they were probably quite as rigidly disciplined mm. um, as Napoleonic troops and I think they probably exercised a little bit more initiative and certainly independence. Mm. Um, I think I was always taken with doing some research when I, I came across it was it one it was a company I can't remember which regiment it in but they were all uh, volunteer school teachers Oh, and when, right. it, when they were given drill instructions, if the drill instructions weren't in the correct grammar, they wouldn't do the <laughs> drill manoeuvre. <laughs> That's and fantastic. And if you kind of take that um, independent, very independent kind of attitude, uh, that feeds down into the way, uh, for me, I think where, the way many of their battles developed. Yeah. They would, they would start off in line. They would then break into. Uh, skirmish almost often less by order and more just at the, because they wanted yeah. to or is the fire was getting hot yeah. you know they would fall back they would regroup uh, and they would come on again and these guys were brave because mm. you know reading accounts of um, you know the cornfield and you know antietam yeah, gettysburg etc mm. malvern hill they put in some pretty serious charges uh, yeah, against yeah. um well defended lines and um, mm. with the with the slightly increased accuracy of the rifle I was, I'm not a great advocate of the fact it's um, you know it's the best thing since sliced bread but it did have an impact I think mm. as you got within about a hundred or so yards mm. uh, and they knew about it uh, mm. and again it's just it, it's inspiring isn't it if you read about what I can't remember which regiment or one of the Texan regiments as it tries to push through the cornfield mm. in that action that is just fantastic isn't it and it's mm. the same uh, similar uh, aspect for me that the, the Napoleonic captures. It is mm. about individual regiments, batteries, and brigades uh, having a significant influence on the overall battle. Because mm. if one regiment or brigade holds, the, the, it, 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 that impacts upon that sector, that core, and then of course that influences the rest of the battle. So it's, it's has a similar outlook for Napoleonics yeah, yeah. to me. Uh, one of the other things that um again relates to what i was talking about sid that the degree of literacy in the american civil war of course has gone up and the other yeah. thing of course we have is photography by this time yeah, yeah. dramatic you know we're going to look at dramatic differences between 1860 you know, and 1815 technological changes not just at weaponry but also to, you know photography a much higher degree of literacy we've got far more kind of memoirs and letters yeah, from the front yeah. line we have a much more uh, and partly i suppose because it's a civil war so there isn't that language barrier i mean for english uh, reasons yeah. of course there isn't the language barrier but there isn't even that kind of th th that sense of them and us uh between the union and confederacy of course is much harder to define and of course it's like the english civil war where families you know to a certain extent was split down down the middle uh, yeah. communities were split down the middle the whole you know issues that people were fighting for for some it was to do with slavery and to others it was completely different sort of motivation mm -hmm. and obviously you know coming up to the modern day it still has you know deep political ramifications that are really difficult to know how to talk about you know because yes. it's you know these are still very very raw and sensitive issues yeah. for many many people so we have, one has to respect that but certainly on the battlefield and the experiences on the battlefield there's this kind of uh, uh embarras de richesse as the as the french would call it you know, there's, there's almost too much to cope with in terms of source material uh, but, and it is all very, very striking. And one of the things, as you mentioned, is that uh, even though by modern stands the level of education is, you know, fairly low, and a lot of the people doing the fighting were just country boys, really, they're yeah. still right from the front, and they talk about their experiences and what they've seen. And there is this, you know, the key difference between uh, that I would identify between European warfare and 
uh, uh, warfare in the American Civil War is to do with morale, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And you've already mentioned there that you'd have this situation where an entire unit, uh, uh, entire unit, would suddenly take fright and kind of skedaddle, yes. and then kind of. Uh, run a few hundred yards, get tired, and the officers would say, "Oh, come on then, boys! You know, pull yourselves <laughs> yes. together." And they'd kind of go, "Oh, all right, all right then, then, and yes. go back in, right?" Yeah. Yes. And I think this is one of the things that I'm endlessly fascinated with. Where, if you like, uh, European um, uh, troops are more regimented; they're yep. more disciplined uh, in many ways. Uh, but also they have that kind of brittleness of something that's very strong, but then yeah. reaches a breaking point. And when it reaches that breaking point, it is broken. It mm -hmm. got, it's gone. And in fact, I've just been from a book uh, doing some research uh, because there's been lots done about kind of combat stress and battle fatigue and shell shock, if you want to call it that, yeah. and the way that that operates on troops and the way that affects a unit that repeatedly sees action uh, over, you know, I mean, you're a guy who's been you know, involved with the military and I don't know whether you've done any tours of duty, but even as a territorial in recent decades, you'd be more likely to see repeated tours of duty uh, yeah. than perhaps in previous generations, because of course, the, the the size of our British armed forces is so small, you know, people are like, right, we need you again, Gov, you know, uh, and uh, and particularly with sort of territorial troops where you're going back into an environment, you know, where you might be working in a bank or a supermarket where you're not amongst other military people who understand what you've been through, uh, which can make someone feel very isolated and can mean that stuff gets stored up and then they're called up again and so on. Uh, now, in, in earlier wars, what I'm reading about is um, battle, the, 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 the experience of battle was so intense and intensive even you know think of gettysburg my god days of you know you're not going anywhere buddy unless yeah. you literally bug out uh, you're exposed to what you can see right in front of you shot and shell and and bullets blowing people to pieces and yet still you've got to pick up your musket, musket and go back in yeah. no surprise that at some point entire units could just suddenly go do you know what had enough and it might not even be related specifically to if you're because I think as war gamers we like to think oh well they've only taken five percent cash <laughs> yes. they're fine they've only yes. taken ten percent keep an eye on fifteen percent yeah. was getting more serious twenty percent all right need to take this more seriously twenty five percent cash is all right we better check the morale boys right yeah. <laughs> now now of course that's not necessarily akin to reality that's a massive generalization and there can be some troops as in the American Civil War like in the American War of Independence interesting. Yeah. And we haven't even yeah. mentioned British Grenadier, so remind me, uh, where suddenly, almost at the first shot, a unit can say, do you know what? It's the wrong day at time of the month. We're off. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. And then other times, the same unit could be up at 30, 40, 50 percent casualties and they're still standing there, Yeah. Okay. which is one of the extraordinary things about conflicts on, on the continent of the united states of america where that happens much more i think than you'd expect to see in a european context dave yeah yeah i i, I think about the the uh, american regiments and that is the fact that many of them knew each other they'd all signed up and they were of uh, a, a similar background uh, yeah. etc and it was uh, much more egalitarian than it was perhaps in the in the European armies. Mm. In the European armies at the time, there's still very much the uh, officer class. There was uh, your NCOs and your rank and file, and you just got on with it, yeah. which did lead, I think, to that. Uh, there was certainly more discipline uh, in the regiments. There wouldn't be much talking back to officers. You can you can yep. be pretty sure of that. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I, as you say, they would they would be uh, far more kind of reliable in inverted commas up to a point but once that point had reached they'd break and go yeah uh, as you say with the uh, with this kind of far more uh, egalitarian uh, outlook from the, the american regiments it would be isn't it uh, how do we feel about the attack today yeah okay well yeah we're up for it we're all going in you can you know those early pictures in, in the war of them all tooled up with their bowie knives and, and everything <laughs> yeah yeah there they're keen, isn't it? They're keen to go. They're all, they're all up for it. All their mates are there. There's the, the officer is perhaps somebody that they can relate to, you know, might come from the local town or the local militia or whatever, and they, they know him. 
uh, and they'll all go together, as you say. That, but that, that perhaps that first shock of combat, which many of them won't have ever experienced mm. in in any shape or form, will temporarily break them. They'll go, oh, mm. we're all going to go to ground. We'll hit the you know we'll hit the dirt. Using modern uh, terminology, uh, but then it is, isn't it? It's a question of how does that the the relationships with the officers, the NCOs, mm. uh, etc., get them in, going again. And mm. you haven't got that relationship in European armies with their rigid discipline, yeah. but you have with that those uh, American kind of volunteer or uh, armies, and, and they've got as, you, as you've identified, they've just got a different way uh, of uh, going to battle in, in, in mm. those in those times. So. In terms of, you know, writing your war games rules, and here we are with the, the beautiful Pickett's Charge, how do you how do you kind of go about representing that? I mean, I, I kind of mentioned just off the side here, this, this chat has inspired me to just remind myself of that remarkable... Uh, there's the, the, the movie of Gettysburg, that's mm. one of the greatest kind of war movies ever made. I mean, to a certain extent, one of the most pompous as well, but... Uh, there's that the, the the case of uh, Joshua Chamberlain, isn't there, up yeah, on Little yeah. Round Top? Uh, was the 20th Main, uh, and that extraordinary because uh, he was a school teacher, just as you yeah, described. Yeah. He was a school teacher. He, this was not a man born to the military life. He was a school teacher before the war, and he joined up, uh, volunteered uh, in the 20th Main, and ended up kind of commanding the regiment uh, in you know one of the bloodiest encounters in military history ever uh one of the most remarkable kind of almost last ditch defenses i mean it, it really came desperately close for them you know uh down to almost their, was it their last round and he had kind of bluffed yeah. it <laughs> and they did it he, he ordered yeah. a bayonet charge down the hill and the confederates were so taken aback that they skedaddled but that's just kind of exactly the kind of extraordinary act of courage you know the red badge of courage that you know you're talking about that's also quite non-european in a way uh yeah. it, incredibly disciplined incredibly courageous but not something you'd expect you know in in denmark or prussia or, or what have you so how do you go about representing those differences between you know you, you you've got your general dame you've got your pickets charge what how do you how do you nuance that dave as a rules it, writer it, it, it's uh, you've already touched on it i think one of the things we uh, i try to do is that in General Dame in the European armies, morale checks are, are discipline checks, mm. and they're they're taken at a much more um, set for set incidents. So mm. you know it'll be uh, X casualties receiving a, a, a serious volley, they will test, mm. uh, and there'll be a, a, a more graduated response to it. Whereas for the American Civil War, we uh, I just went for the right. It's the see the elephant test, which was which uh, didn't have steps it was literally so you could it would be you to be the usual modifiers but you could come under fire from skirmishers uh, who could who put you under some accurate fire you have to take a see the elephant test and you would break straight away right. so you could have a fresh regiment that yeah. would break straight away uh, and then go straight back but because of the um the way the command structure uh, would generally work you'd probably get them back again Mm. And they haven't taken very many losses, if any. Mm. So they'll be back again to give it another go. Mm. Uh, well, and at the other end of the scale, they can, if you're if you're rolling well, they can keep going uh, until mm. clearly they reach a certain point where they've had really quite enough. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And they're not going to. So it's about building uh, unpredictability into uh, both the units uh, and the brigades. And and uh, one of the other things we did was 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 to simply make uh, brigades have a uh, a rally order where the brigade could be pulled slightly out of the line and recover casualties in inverted commas mm. i.e its morale and its fatigue to a limited extent and therefore be sent back into the action which is not something that you we uh, would have in the napoleonic wars mm. or crimea or whatever mm. so it's it, it's that uncertainty and that kind of very flexible if i can use that word <laughs> response yeah, yeah. to combat that um, many of the american regiments had yeah, uh, because I'm thinking in a European equivalent, you know, if you have an arm, uh, if you have a unit that does break, uh, mm. you probably have to send a, a general galloping back 
to try and rally yeah. them, wouldn't you? You yeah. literally have to be, you know, the, the divisional general removes himself from the battle, which of course has consequences, you know, yeah. because yeah. If, if they're if they're focusing on trying to rally, you know, the twenty fourth Borset Shears, <laughs> they're they're not going to be able to respond to whatever the enemy's doing. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas, as you say, often in the American Civil War, it's the unit themselves that kind of like, okay, guys, I think we've run far enough now. We're out of range. <laughs> Let's have a sit down. What do we think? Quite democratic. Yeah. How do we feel about that? Well, all right, yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to leave the guys from Maine behind. Let's let's go yeah, back and you know yeah. do our, yeah, do our yeah. bit. Extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And the, you just have to read the history of the period. The number of times in which it happened, mm. it's amazing. It's amazing. Very different kind of different kind of fluidity to yes, an American yeah, Civil War. Yeah, battle. definitely. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and also, of course, we're so used in 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 European battles to big stacks of cavalry on the flanks and probably yeah. a big stack of cavalry in reserve. Not like that in the Americans to no, war, is it? Yeah, definitely. If, 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 if anything for the Americans, it's, and especially with the Union or Federal Army, it's big stacks of artillery in reserve yeah. or, or, or covering the flanks or covering certain mm. areas. Mm. And, then, and it's the kind of artillery that took over the role of your your heavy cavalry regiments or your breakthrough regiments or your, mm. your screening cavalry brigades. It was done with with, with artillery, yeah. um, and that was that was had a significant, I think, impact upon uh, upon the battlefields. Because uh, dwelling for a moment, uh, you mentioned earlier kind of the the development of technology and to what extent did it influence the battlefield or not? But of course, it, it is one of those extraordinary things that. I mean, I can remember even from an earlier ACW rule set that I had, the variety of weapons available at the beginning of the war compared to what was available at the end of the war. You know, yep. At the beginning of the war, pretty much all muzzle loading, pretty much all smooth bore. By the end of the war, man, you've got, you know, rifles that would could take their place on the modern battlefield basically yep. yeah. and and rifled guns as well that yep. were i mean the whitworth gun that could basically was, yeah. Yeah. take the eyes off a fly at <laughs> two thousand oh, yards British, kind of, of thing. Yeah, absolutely yeah, boy, absolutely <laughs> yeah. um and it, funnily enough in my in my uh war game soldier and strategy uh, series about tactics I, I wrote about artillery developments and and the kind of the breech loading thing where the british for a while kind of reached a, a dead end because they couldn't get a, a nice seal so they went yeah. back to, went back to muzzle muzzle loading yes. right <laughs> uh for a while which was just bizarre but yes the, the this whole um thing by the end of the american civil war and of course special units like uh Bredens or burdens whatever it's burdens, sharp shooters, sharp shooters yeah. and so forth uh and repeating rifles as well you know kind of magazine loading repeating rifles the yeah. winchester and all these kind of weapons that we take for granted as part of american c culture frankly culture. nowadays yeah. that that kind of developed during that period so in terms of the rule writing dave how did you balance that because it would be very easy for kind of the techno nerd yeah. <laughs> to start getting quite excited about the fact that well you know i've got the you know 1863 <laughs> model of that reach you know, loaders da -da 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 -da. Yeah. you've got well you've got only the 1862 version how how do you kind of counter I, that and focus on the flow of the game dave yeah well i, I kind of uh came away from it slightly to think that it doesn't really matter what the basic troop is is armed with i'm not going to be overly concerned about rates of fire etc etc mm -hmm. uh, and what you uh, I, I tend to do is just just to touch on those weapons mm -hmm. in particular tactical situations where you would expect them to have a superiority mm -hmm. so uh, if you're in skirmish order uh, that's where uh, you touch upon uh, breech loaders is the fact that they get uh, a benefit because uh, the reasons are low they got potentially yeah. a higher rate of, uh, rate of fire etc etc mm. uh, and then you touch also touch on repeaters because mm. repeaters, repeaters again they can move up uh, move up the scale and that and that's where you kind of draw it in you think right in these tactical situations the particular weapon will most likely have an impact so we'll include it there Mm. But what we don't do is, in, is, is go down to the minutiae of every volley to yeah. find out what every company's got. Uh, yeah. And you just go, a volley is a volley is a volley. Because mm. at the end of the day, you're probably you're, you're firing off your rounds at a steady pace. And if you're lucky enough to have uh, a faster weapon, if you do fire at the rate they, they potentially fire at, 
you'll be out of rounds in about five minutes. I was going to say, because of course yeah. there's the other thing, ammunition expenditure. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. all very well having a, a rifle that could pump out, you know, 60 rounds a minute. Yep. Uh, but how many bullets can you carry? Yeah, that's <laughs> it. I can recall one very uh, interesting exercise once where I was in command. It was great. We led an ambush <laughs> and I, I, I even managed to get what it was, the section or the platoon into the right place and even launched the ambush. I had, I think, 100 rounds plus extra bits. Um, and I can distinctly recall in about 30 seconds, I'd fired off every single round because it's all exciting and great fun. And I was digging into my pouches and reloading. And I thought, hang on, I mean, I've got a stoppage or a jam here. It's not, what's something's going on? Take the magazine out, reloading it. I was just reloading empty magazines because oh, I'd fired them God. all off in about really? 30 seconds. Then I had to sort of sit back, do a double take, check all my magazines. <laughs> yep, they're all empty. Yep. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, you know, and that's, that's just in a you know a, a, a fairly easy you know um exercise with with uh, with blanks yeah, etc yeah. you know put that into a combat situation absolutely it's a different ball game because there's the, also there's the uh, the famous uh, kind of um episode where they looked at the muskets found after was it gettysburg or anti tam i can't remember where she was and the number of rounds rammed down the barrel so someone yeah. had been kind of but they'd had misfires and not realised because of the din of the battle. They hadn't actually realised that their own musket hadn't gone off. And yeah. so they just loaded another. And they found some muskets with like six, seven, eight, nine, ten rounds yeah. rammed down the barrel. Well, thank God it didn't go off. <laughs> yeah, right? see, I, I think that's called, there's a term for that, isn't it? It's called, um, <clears throat> I think it's called fussing, where you're doing something that yeah. kind of, you can focus on in the battle. Yeah. It's not necessarily contributing to the battle, but you can just focus on it. Yeah. So it, it is, it's reloading or it's, or it's, it's whatever it was, you know, fiddling with the radio or, or yeah. trying to get the mortar to work. If you yeah. just focus on that, you'll get through. Yeah. And that's probably what that, it's poor, a way of coping so with so fear, doing. apart from anything else. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, brilliant. And, of course, there, there was that other thing, just finally in the American Civil War, that I think got noticed probably in the American Civil War for the first time, which is this tendency that if you've got men advancing against the enemy, mm. uh, trying to prevent them from stopping and shooting, shooting. Yeah. too early, because once they start yeah. shooting, trying to get them moving forward again, absolute nightmare. Yeah, yeah? yeah they won't, yeah. And, uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the same, isn't it? In, there's um, some very famous things. You go back to the Napoleonics where, where Ney was ordering people to take the flints out of their muskets so they couldn't fire. Yeah. And that's a, uh, exactly the same thing, isn't it? In, in the, if you stop and start firing, they won't go forward again because mm. you've lost that moment, that momentum of yeah. the charge. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things we put into, in, into Pickett's charge. It'll either, you'll either succeed in your charge or advance or you'll be halt, you'll halt, and you'll start having some close-range musketry. Mm. But the actual crossing of bayonets in um, the picket charge rules is quite quite rare, and that yeah. tries to reflect that bit. Yeah, yeah, it would be. Right, um, we're going to move on because we've been chatting for a couple of hours. Hope to, no, hope, no. <laughs> hope our listeners, hope our listeners have been listening, and I hope you're all right for time still, Dave, because we. No, no problem. Yeah. We have got a little bit still to cover because you're a man who's not only written. Napoleonic rules, who's not only written American Civil War rules, but has also written World War Two rules. And of course, we mentioned back at the top of the show, one of the first times I met you, you were playing a World War Two game with your battle group uh, Panzer Grenadier rules. But not content with that, you've gone all lardified and you're getting all right <laughs> of and, and revisiting periods that everyone thought, all right, Dave's written those, that's fine, I've got used to that. No, 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 you're not going to leave your audience alone. Here comes, not yet published, but I've had a, an exclusive glimpse at, because they're coming out soon, Battalion HQ, yes. right? Yes. Uh, World War Two War Games Rules Battalion Orders, Orders Group Officer Commanding, Battalion Command, blah 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 uh, There's all sorts of stuff it says here And this is quite a hefty tome By the looks of things With many words in it uh, it's, a proper, it's a proper book mate Look at that Now the audience can't see this Because they mustn't Because it's pre-production I'm getting a sneak <laughs> glimpse at it So Dave, tell us about the new rule set uh, when we're likely to see it, and what makes it different 
from what's gone before from oh, from the stable of DCR Brown. It's um I knew you'd ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, as as I've kind of hinted at before, isn't it? It's this uh, this journey uh, into friction uh, plus the desire to try and model World War Two, which is I find particularly difficult or challenging. Yep. Whichever phrase you, you you want to use. And I kind of moved in that direction with uh, Panzer Grenadier, and I concentrated on I wanted to put command and control uh, to feature more heavily in World War Two rules because I used to play a lot of uh, different World War Two rules uh, that seem to have either no command or control at all or mm. or just nodded at it mm. um, and I, I'll, I'll unashamedly mention that I played quite a bit of squad leader uh, in the oh, past that it was, it used to be a great game yeah great game. Yeah, it was fantastic but there was absolutely no control, command and control in it, or very little, uh, and I could never quite figure out what, you know, something like a ten minus three leader was actually supposed to represent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, he could, but he could. He was pretty deadly in a firefight, and that's what I kind of noted. So I thought, right, it's similar. The journey is similar to General Darmay, isn't it? It's trying to focus the player on making decisions that are more concerned with commanding your troops mm. than they are with firing them. Mm. So it's less concentration on, um, you know, rates of fire, different weapons, um, differentiing between a, a whatever, a 17-pounder firing APDS and fin stabilise this. Mm. Uh, you know, the weapons are, are clearly all in it and there's clear differences. Mm. But the main focus on the rules is about... Uh, using orders uh, to manage your troops and mm. bring them on at the right time. Mm. Uh, and so in order to do that, we've uh, adopted a, a two-tier command structure. So there's HQ orders, right. which are the special um, orders for command and above, which is about ordering in artillery, ordering in battalion mortars, uh, company commanders getting down in the dirt and getting troops to do stuff, mm and bringing on reserves, which is important. Mm. And the other aspects that you need to manage are your normal platoon orders, because the basic operational unit is the platoon, although tanks and guns can be operated mm. at section level. And you've only got a limited number of these. Mm. And therefore, you need to manage two pools of orders. Uh, the platoon orders come and go every turn, and you can, you know, you can generally think, well, I've got a handful of those, I know what to do. The HQ or battalion orders, um, you can store, but you don't get very many of them. Oh, okay. And they are linked to the initiative, and the initiative oh, is important. Right. So he who wins the initiative can impose the battle upon the enemy. Oh, okay. And so the more of these HQ orders you uh, can either hold or use, the more likely you're to win the initiative. Uh, and you'll find yourself, if you're on the on the opposing side, you'll quickly find yourself on the uh, on the outside of your opponent's OODA loop, if I can use that, oh, that uh, optimistic phrase. Nick will be listening and he loving love that. It. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll find that if you're, on the, if you're on the outside of that, all you're trying to do is you're responding to your opponent's actions and you can't impose your, your, um, your will and your battlefield plan upon the opponent. And it's a struggle between... Uh, the players to achieve kind of battlefield dominance. But, you know, oh. we're still using platoons and they're still yeah. firing. We've still got tanks and Shermans, you yeah. know, still struggling to knock out tigers or panthers yeah. or whatever. Um, but it it tries to move away from traditional kind of World War Two, the traditional World War Two rule game, look at rules and focus more on the, the command that, so that's, its stance. that's really interesting. So the game is as much at kind of the meta level as it is at the kind of nitty gritty level. Yeah. Like you've got this kind of clash of wills almost. Yes. Yeah. Going on. That's it. You've got, uh, and it's it's a, the the player is, is has got to think right. When am I going to use the my HQ orders? Uh, when do I want to use my uh, company commanders to to give me uh, a boost with with extra orders? But then if you decide to use your company commanders, which, you know, each company will mm. have one, that will 
detract from you winning the initiative because these guys aren't focusing on the battle because you're dragging them in to try and get more battalion orders. So there's a lot of uh, uh, decisions uh, to be made and there's a lot of risk that goes with it. Uh, and combine that with, with, you know, dice rolls, luck. Yeah. It's a lot of management. Okay. That's that's really interesting. So it sounds to me that, uh, okay, kind of in terms of the way it would feel to play a game yeah. of this. Um, yeah. you're, you, what you're saying is that you're going to be, uh, it's rather like um, Chain of Command. Uh, mm. Where I mean, obviously, there's a Lardy influence there. Where you've got your you rolled your what's your... chain of command? <laughs> <laughs> uh, where you've rolled your, your your kind of handful of dice, and you've got a number of things that those dice indicate that you can do as a result of you know that hand of dice. Uh, and of course, it's slightly different because a turn in chain of command means something slightly different to yeah, what it's, it's, much, it's a much lower you could scale. Say in a yeah. phase right if you said yeah. in a phase and that gives you limited options uh and um it means that your if you like it to use a card game equivalent so your hand management as it were yeah. Yeah. uh it becomes very important that that becomes the that aspect of the game becomes as important as any tactical decisions that you might be making. Would yes, that be true yeah. to say? Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's the decision making is similar, although obviously the mechanics are, di- are different. Mm. But the decision making uh, is similar. If you've e- the platoon orders are your, your standard stuff, and you can use them. And if you get a reasonable amount, that's great. You can move up your infantry platoons, move up your tank platoons, engage in in fire, etc. But the really important stuff is uh, res- restricted to those uh, HQ orders where you think, right, um, do I request um, you know, off-board uh, uh, heavier ar- artillery support? But that's going to cost me. Mm. Uh, do I have enough of them? Do I want to bring in battalion mortars, which are probably actually used in the game more than anything else? Mm. Um, because they, they will cost you an HQ order, but they can be quite effective, especially mm. in laying smoke, etc. Mm. Uh, and then you think, I want to, my company commanders, they can be given HQ orders that give the troops kind of enhanced orders. They really, you know, mm. basically kick up the backside, let's get yeah, moving. Yeah. You know, the captain or the major's moving in and the things are, you know, getting done. And it's a question of when you use those orders to, you know, to influence the battle, uh, mm. to move in the direction you want to. Mm. Uh, and finally, you've always got to keep at least, a, you know, one or a few in, in reserve because otherwise you can't bring on reserves. Ah, so right, uh, okay. if it's not one of the games where you can just willy-nilly bring on reserves any place, any time you like on the board edge. It, those are just bringing on reserves is the decisions of the battalion HQ. Right. And so you need orders to do so, and you bring right. them on at certain places. Okay. All right. So uh, just in terms of, I mean, obviously we don't want to get into too much detail because People are going to have to go and buy the rules here and find out, aren't they, uh, when it comes out. Uh, but give us an idea of kind of what would an average game look like? How many miniatures would be on the table? I mean, yeah, uh, it, yeah. it's I've, I've based it on uh, a, a kind of a standard war games, in inverted commas, infantry battalion. Uh, and so in figures wise, that's three companies mm-hmm. uh, and each company is made up of three platoons. And the three platoons are made up generally of three sections. So that's just three bases of, of troops. It doesn't matter how they're based. It's a platoon is three bases. And generally, and the infantry platoons operate as a platoon. Right. The bases are only there so that we can take off, you know, we can take off casualties or, mm-hmm. or, or maneuver them. And the, your battalion will be supported by, you know, heavy weapons companies, um, uh, tanks or uh, anti-tank guns, uh, you know, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and so your that's your generally your force. So the an average one, you'll field the um, battalion. So you'll have well, roughly nine figures into a, in a platoon. Mm-hmm. So you know, nine times three, what's that? Twenty-seven yeah. plus a company commander, thirty figures to a company, ninety figures tops. But it doesn't have to be. You can. Mm. You can choose whatever you want to put on your figure base. It doesn't matter. It'll mm-hmm. it'll fit. It'll fit. Um, it'll fit any system. Right. And then you just uh, add a few um, tanks and guns. You can have a, a platoon of 
Shermans maybe, so three Shermans and a Firefly, maybe backed up with a little kind of you know, a few Recky Stewarts or something, or something like that, and maybe a few six pounders. So that's kind of a force. It's a fairly, I wanted to go for a science game that was fairly manageable. Yeah. And that you could you get really get to grips with at a club game in an evening over uh, three hours or so, or if you wanted to play a larger game, uh, you can. Uh, play with a battle group, so you can have two battalions side by side, oh, right. uh, okay. opposing uh, uh, either one large battalion or, or two battalions on the other side. So if you had a you know an all day game or something, you could expand it to that as well. Okay. Do you, do you see this as being a game that most people would play with what 15 mil miniatures? Or? I've, 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 I've settled on the the kind of I think or I hope the, the normal scales. It's either 15 or 20 mil, but also with looking at uh, people who've got 10 mil. Right. So you could play in any of those scales. Thank okay. you. You know, probably wouldn't suit 28, but you could do. But 28, you're probably pushing it, I think. Okay. Yeah, unless you've got a very big table. Well, yes. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> is there a kind of is there a ground scale that goes with the game with, that you had in mind as you were designing it? Yeah, or it's about. That... Uh, so I, I always keep these things very rough and ready. Yeah. Uh, because, but it's roughly if you're looking at 50 mil. I think it's about uh, one inch is about 20 to 25 yards. Okay, it's kind of one uh, one millimeter to a yard kind of. Yeah, thing. Uh, it's it's fair, that's fairly easy to manage. So yeah, yeah. Uh, on the flat, your infantry, uh, I've I've given them about for 15 mil about a 12 inch range, and I've gone away from the normal range brackets. There's no kind of um, long range or anything on the right. flat. You're either firing at ground level and you get a certain range. Or if you're elevated, um, second-story buildings on oh, rises, okay. grounds, you have a further range, basically, because you can see further, yeah. so you can engage people at longer ranges. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so terrain becomes more important. So you want to get your your platoons and your tanks and troops into positions that give you enhanced fire positions and yeah, yeah. a better range. Sounds absolutely brilliant. Are, are we going to see these demoed at a show near you sometime soon? <laughs> show near you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I'm doing at the moment, I've had a... Um, uh, a, a demo game and I'll be putting out a, a kind of after action report of a Normandy game with uh, paragraphs about how the rules work um, over on the Two Fat Lardies and the General Brigade web websites cool. and I suspect that um, I'll be either could be demoing them uh, maybe uh, colours or sell wig depending on um, okay, how so it fits in with what other club members want so to do so kind of autumn 2019 that's yeah, 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 we're looking around there. Okay, yeah. fantastic, brilliant, and obviously, what the Lardies are really good at with their rule sets is doing videos of them as well. To demonstrate yes, the, 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 unfortunately, I will probably have to do one of those. For... <laughs> <laughs> You're a star of the silver screen. Well, that's brilliant. I mean, that uh, I'm looking forward to that. And folks, so keep your eyes peeled for Battalion HQ. Sounds like something I'm personally very interested in as well um let's kind of um talk a bit more i mean we, we're kind of coming towards the end of our time roughly <laughs> i hope people have stuck with it uh, it's been fun uh, but uh, i i blithely on my uh kind of uh show notes here just typed in oh yeah anything else you fancy chatting about i don't know the weather or you know what, what's your favorite color or whatever and no dave came back to me and said, oh do you mean the ancients rule set then and i said what ancients rule set he said oh yeah right well there's an ancients rule set so dave you better tell us about this because this is <laughs> Something I didn't know came under your sort of list of interests, mate. Oh, yeah, ancients. I, well, I, I'll, I'll hop back to the beginning of our conversation when my hoplites got slaughtered by yes, Vikings. Yes, of course, yes. Were empty choppers. I thought that might have <laughs> end, ended your interest in <laughs> ancients warfare. <laughs> yeah, I played, I, I've played quite a bit of ancients uh, all the way through that. You know, uh, DBA, D, DBM, etc. I enjoyed some aspects of it. Perhaps I didn't enjoy some other aspects yeah. of it, but I, I do like uh, I do like the ancient period. And it's always been on the cards to produce uh, a, a set of ancient rules at the slightly more tactical level. Again, mm. similar to General Brigade, General Darmay, etc. Rather than fighting an entire battle, you know, with ten of Caesar's legions or you know, in the, you know, in the Gallic Wars or something, yeah. that you would probably be concentrating on. Uh, um, as yet to be defined, but maybe uh, a legion or two, mm -hmm. and you'd be concentrating on on how that legion fights, uh, and and how that their particular battle uh, progresses. Um, 
you know, for instance, in the early uh, Republican Roman, you've got the, the th- you know, the, the three lines of, of infantry, basically, mm. you know, you've got your, your, your siloi, as, as they're often referred to, you've got your main legionaries, and you've got the triaria, you know, at the back, yeah. it's about how were they used in yeah, combat, yeah. And how do we ref- reflect that, and mm. it, it, it was always slightly annoying for me, and I had those, I could never actually get the triari into them, because they were always just amalgamated into everything else, yeah. I think, okay, well, let's, how did the Romans work with it? How did the uh, barbarians work? How did uh, other people work? And what tactics were used slightly more uh, at the coal face right. uh, than other rules? And, um, you know, and I've been uh, on a number of occasions involved in some fairly, how shall I say, nitty gritty shield work yeah. um, with my previous employment. Yeah. It does give you a, a, an insight into uh, ha- how you know, um, how, what the, they may have fought. Mm. Uh, many of our, the tactics I used down at our training centres were distinctly Roman in their style. Yeah, yeah. Even rank replacement, you yeah. know, calling calling the front rank back, sending in the next one, and then sending in the third one and linking it in with cavalry. Mm. It's, it's all kind of ancient tactics. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, uh, that's on the well. It's kind of on the back burner of the design front at the moment, and uh, who knows? Maybe it might see the light of day one day if if Richard's mad enough to um, <laughs> to release it. <laughs> I, well, it sounds great. I mean, I've, uh, having had that conversation with uh, Richard Lockwood of the Society of Ancients the other week, um, kind of reminded me about you know, God, there's so much about the ancient era that absolutely fascinates me, mm. and of course, it's such a vast era. Yeah. I mean, today, funnily enough, uh, I've I've put it away somewhere now. But um, I just took delivery today of the latest uh, thing, the Hail Caesar rule, uh, rule yeah. book supplement yeah. uh, on the Bronze Age, you know, in, in the Near East. So you've got all your Hittites and Sumerians and Assyrians yeah. and, uh, and of course, Egyptians and Trojans and all that kind of uh, <laughs> stuff, which is kind of biblical area stuff that, you yeah. know, this is why I confess it's always sort of fascinated me. I've never actually played a game in that period. And then when you see it, you know, arrays of Egyptian chariots, chariots and archers yeah. and what exactly. have you, it it looks fantastic. And yeah. and um, you know, pointing at my old school gaming shelf here, there's a book I'm going to pluck, as I do with my guests. I'm plucking <laughs> off my old school the, uh, book here, Ancient Battles for War Gamers by oh, Charles yes. Grant, uh, yeah. that has an Egyptian chariot on the front cover uh, and of course covered uh, uh kadesh and and that sort of stuff yeah. um f- a fascinating kind of pre-ancients era if you like that uh, i've i've always kind of is uh, there's a kind of a romance i suppose because when i was a kid and i went to the tutankhamun exhibition when it came to london the british museum in the 1970s no even before that 1960s wasn't it um oh, that's a long time ago but just seeing all that kind of gold and azure blue stuff and the, the kind of makeup they wore and being fascinated but being very aware that wow this is a very different almost an alien culture and it kind of gives that the beginning of the ancient era this particular flavor and then as you say you do as you described early moving through you You've got all what we describe as kind of the classical area with the, the Greek city states uh, and all that sort of thing. And then moving through to the I mean, the, even the, that that kind of um, growth of Rome from this tiny city yeah, state yeah. to then dominate Europe. Yeah. My God. And North Africa and everywhere as well. Extraordinary. Uh, Alexander the Great, the Macedonians, and then coming right up into kind of early Dark Ages, that sort of stuff. The, the thing is, as soon as you start talking about writing an ancient's rule set, and I know this because, as I think I've mentioned before, I was going to be putting an ancient's rule set in the Wargaming Compendium until it <laughs> dawned on me that, oh my God, this is a vast task. Yeah. Because yeah. here we are, we, t- we were talking earlier about, you know, you're writing a set of horse and musket rules. And you think, well, that's fairly simple, straightforward. Horse and musket, paper, scissors, stone, you know. When you start thinking about an ancient rule set and the different eras it has to cover, the different technologies, the different tactics, and the different combinations of foes, it's like, oh, my God, the playtesting alone. So you have my enormous admiration, Dave. <laughs> for taking I've, pro- it- I've, asked, I've, I'm probably most certainly going to 
restrict it to all the kind of classical Greek and Rome period or thereabouts, because as you've correctly identified, it's such a vast period in its entirety. I think, you know, to do it justice, I think you just, I, I'm just going to focus perhaps on just, uh, you know, that Greco Roman uh, right. a period. I think I'll probably be able to get away with that. That's probably what most people have got. Which would be quite interesting, wise. actually, because I think one of the. Th- other criticisms left or were, you know, people got tired of the WRG rules because it was yeah. kind of 4,000 BC or whatever it was yes. up to 1485 <laughs> AD, yeah. 5,000 yeah. years of history. And I think uh, that what a lot of um, ancient gamers feel, uh, begins to feel is like, yeah, we actually want something a bit more nuanced for the specific yeah. bit that yep. I'm interested yep. in. So I think yep. that's probably a sensible decision in <laughs> practical right. terms and in philosophical <laughs> terms. Uh, but yeah, so I think we're going to watch that with interest, Dave. Uh, good luck with that. Keep us posted. Um, I will. I will. <laughs> uh, brilliant. Um, crikey. We're nearly at the end. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I just want to ask you, because you you became one of my patrons. Thank you very much indeed. Indeed, yes. Lieutenant Brown. Uh, <laughs> uh, Where's the of... mess? <laughs> I know, this is your first question. Where's the officer's mess? We'll have to sort something out about that. You're just after the booze, aren't you? Uh, yeah. But so uh, just let people, so why did you decide, other than because you're a lovely bloke, to, mm. to kind of support me on Patreon? What made you, you know, decide, ah, actually, yeah, you're up for that? Well, it's because if you um, uh, look at what's gone beforehand, isn't it? Uh, there was you produced battle games, you edited battle games, uh, and I bought uh, battle games and I supported it, etc., uh, etc. Et so, uh, to me, it's just a simple uh, extension uh, of that. It it permits um, new ideas, you know, you to these podcasts, uh, for an example, um, you know, to to push war games uh, articles out into the war games community that if we didn't support you wouldn't be there so True. yeah I'm, I'm you know i'm more than happy to uh, su- support you to that i mean I'll, I'll either buy your magazine or i'll be your patron you know? <laughs> <laughs> but well, it is i think it's a, it's important it, it it allows people to develop ideas develops uh, war games uh, material and put it out there so that others others can see it and others can view it and others can comment on it well bless your heart sir thank you very much indeed it's appreciated um and well i think probably after crikey two and a half hours we <laughs> probably, i probably ought to let you get back to your life thank you so much for coming on dave it's been brilliant because as i said at the top of the show i mean you've um, i've known your face as it were for a long time now my god yeah, 2006 yeah. when i first met you and there's mm, uh, quite a, 13 years dave 13 very good very good yeah. uh, and i've yet along with a number of other people who have known for a long time but i've yet to actually kind of cross swords with you across the table we must correct we must game yes we've we must. never actually yeah. rolled dice in anger against each other yeah. uh I, i'm certainly you know uh, there's you've got so many rule sets now that i'm fascinated because i've got <laughs> still unpainted some people are, i've got a lot of 10 mil acw figures but oh, I'm, going to be, yeah. I'm going to be using pickett's charge with them i've got exactly. quite a lot of napoleonic figures that i want to try general darme because i like the way that you're talking about, you know, how the the raison d'etre of those rules, and now what with your mm. new battalion HQ coming out? For me, that the World War Two thing, I'm still debating. You know, I've been playing some Chain of Command. I'm still debating about where I want to pitch. You know, what level I want yeah, to pitch yeah, myself yeah. at, and I maybe I'm a battalion level guy rather than kind of a, just a platoony squaddy level guy. It was really funny actually. You talking about squad leader. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god let's not even mention aso advanced squad leader. oh no don't go there <laughs> squad leader back in the day how could a rule set have so many rules you know volumes of rules all you know 1.1 1.2 1.3 uh you know without any command and control rules as you labor, say labor of love which yeah. also that sort of takes me back to bruce quarry back in the 70s and 80s you know we had all those statistics and the only command and control is well if napoleon's there he's plus five 
That's it. That was it. Yes. That was it. So uh, I think, you know, it's going to be really fascinating to see another take on introducing friction, that good old lardy Clausewitzian word, into war games at this different level. I'm going to be fascinated to see this. And I'm going to be reading this preview copy assiduously. (laughs) And I should be coming up and tapping you on the shoulder at shows and saying, Dave, about rule 41.3.b.c. It's rubbish. (laughs) (laughs) And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on, Dave. Hope you've enjoyed yourself. And uh, that's been great. Thank you very much, Henry. You're extremely welcome. It'd be great to have you on. And I think you're a man who deserves more exposure, but in a good way. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, Henry. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. That's been brilliant. Cheers, mate.